have is that let's let's not offend the gentlemen. The, the we're gods. live. Just not so you know, folks, if you're listening to this today, I mean, for 20 minutes, Adam wants us to talk about vaccine. Gerard says, <laughs> I don't want to offend people. And they've been going back yeah. and forth. Adam, I'm telling you, we're not going to do it. We're Good. not going to do it All today. Right, fine. You're going to be okay with that? We have a special guest today. We have Let's a special guest today, me. Michael Francis. If you're excited that Michael is here with us, give us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to the channel, especially if you want to see Mafia States of America, because that's mm-hmm. a project we're going to be talking about today, Michael. That's it. How you feeling? I feel good. Yeah? I'm in Florida. What could be better? <laughs> right? So it was right. interesting. Yesterday, uh, we're having dinner at Casa D'Angelo, which, by the way, the food, Excellent. legendary. Excellent. They crushed it. You yes. know, they closed it at 10 mm-hmm. o'clock. We left at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Not once did Dino complain. Not a word. If his name is Dino, it could be Jose, but he claims he's from Italy. So, you know, well, I think the, he was afraid of Adam. That's what happened. That's exactly what <laughs> yeah. it is. What was it? Right next to Michael, he's afraid of me. No, no, (laughs) kosher nostra. Kosher nostra. Kosher (laughs) nostra. That was hilarious. Those are my my people. That's Adam's jokes uh, joke. But we had a good time last night. And yesterday we were at Shooters, and uh, I'm going to Shooters to meet with my Goldman guy. And then I see uh, Michael there with the family. I'm like, Michael, what are you guys doing here? It was an interesting story he had with Shooters. If you don't mind sharing with the audience. Yeah. First of all, when I went by it on boat, I didn't recognize it because they redid the whole thing like seven, eight years ago. But That was the first uh, date I had with my wife. She was 20 years old, and um, actually I was home. I had a place in Delray Beach. I was home sleeping. Somebody said, hey, that beautiful girl is there tonight. You know, come by. So I got dressed, went down there. Specifically uh, to see her. Specifically to see her. Wow. And uh, we spent a couple hours together, and the rest is history, as they say. Literally, the rest is history. History, yes. Yeah. And you've got how many kids together? We have four. By the way. Beautiful kids. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, one of them is apparently, a, he was a bodybuilder. That's well, yeah. my daughter. My, your daughter. Yeah, yeah. She, mm-hmm. she's a personal trainer. And, uh, you know, they're all into, all the yeah. girls are into fitness. My wife and all the girls. The guys, were, you know, we're athletes. But and, by, by the way. Here, water skiers. Fun fact. Yes. yes. Michael, people don't believe your age, just so you know. People want to check your ID because they don't believe your age. Michael, if you're comfortable saying it on camera. Oh, I'm good. I'm 70 years old. 70 just years old. 70. Yeah. Water skiing yesterday in Fort Lauderdale. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you, you actually say, you went know, water skiing yesterday. I went water skiing. I hadn't done okay. it in a long time, but it was, it was great. And I wanted to do it here in Florida. The water's so warm. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to get out of the I water. I want to do a quick great. Uh, commercial for Florida. How many times have you been in the water in California? You've been living there for 40 years almost. One 20? time. And how many times have you been in Florida water? <laughs> One time. One, I'll never go back. That was okay. like 35 years ago. Never go. It's too cold. Yeah. You know, and especially now, I got in here in the beach, and yeah. you don't want to get out of the water. Water's just fine. Come on Amazing. down is what you're Amazing. saying. Amazing. How different is Florida today versus back in the days when the mob, because the mob had a lot of uh, yeah. things they did in Florida. This was a hub. I mean, just Meyer Lansky the, was doing stuff here back in the days. This was great to go to Cuba before, you know, things were shut down with the hotel when Lansky was running. How, how much of a change is Florida today versus what it was back in the days? I mean, there's still guys living down here that I know of, but uh, it was a big spot for us. I mean, when we went anywhere, we'd come to Florida. That was it. Yeah. And I had a big, you know, gas operation down here. I loved it down here. But uh, different today. I mean, everything's different today, Patrick. I mean, it's not the same influence, the same presence anywhere in the country, really. Even in New York. You know, there was a time when... I'm not kidding. Every single day, you pick up the New York Post, the New York Daily News, there was a mob story. Now, I read the New York Post every morning online. Maybe every six months you'll see something, mm. uh, you know. And it's, Why is that? You know, th- things have changed. I mean, you know, the, the, the old guard is gone. Mm. The new guys are, you know, staying undercover. It's not the same as it was before in any way, shape, or form. You know, look, you got to give the credit to Giuliani and, uh, you know, that whole force back in the mid-'80s early to mid-80s, when he really started effectively using the Racketeering Act and put everybody away and changed everything, took the union control away, did, did so much damage to that life, which is, I guess, good for everybody else, but it was bad for the life. And really. so this is back in the days when, when you were doing 8 to $12 million a week. How much of it was here? How much of it was New York? We, uh, well, I got indicted down here. We were, I think, I think it was like $190 million that uh, they indicted us for down there. We had a big operation down here. I was trying to move most of what we had up there down here. To Florida? Yes. When you say down here, what part of Florida? All over? It was or? Broward Dade. Yeah. Okay, I guess. South Broward Dade, yes. Yeah, I, I just re- want to revisit something that you said, because I don't want to gloss over this. You said you got to give respect to Rudy Giuliani for what he did. So uh, do you respect Rudy? Is that what you're saying? Well, I didn't back then. You know, you, t- <laughs> you told me he was going to give me right. 100 years when he indicted me, but uh, I do now, yeah. 
What changed? Obviously, just age, wisdom? No, listen, you know, he was good at what he did. He was better at what he did than we were at what we did at the time. So wow. he got us, you know, there's no doubt about it. He used it. Look, my case, I don't believe I should have been involved in that case, but he didn't frame me. There was some semblance of something that he could have indicted me on. He did. But I was, I was acquitted, so I beat it, and it was legitimately acquitted. But, uh, look, you got to give him credit. I mean, he was a good prosecutor. He knew what he was doing, and uh, I think he, he firmly believed that what he was doing was the right thing. So you can't mm-hmm. get mad at somebody like that. Well, how, do you, to, how do you process that? I mean, this is his biggest competitor, you know. You well, deal no. with competitors. I mean, what, you say what you is, talk what to is, What does Peyton Manning say about Brady? Oh, yeah. What are you going to say? I mean, the guy is better than you. You know how hard it is for Manning to be able to swallow yeah. it and say, hey, this guy, you know, yesterday a quote came out about uh, what Brady said back in 2012. Mm-hmm. And a guy asked the question, says, man, how's it going to feel when you pass up Montana? He says, I'm not going after Montana. I'm going after Jordan. Mm. So think about meaning. I don't yeah. care about winning five. Mm-hmm. I care about winning seven. Right. Because seven is one more than Michael then. So and he did it. And he right. did it. So, and, and by the way, it's tougher to win seven rings in the yeah. NFL than it is to win six in the NBA because in the NBA, you get seven games. Yeah. So meaning you can have a bad day and lose to Eli Manning twice. Right. Mm-hmm. It ain't going right. to happen in the NBA. You're not going to have four great games. Right. You, know, you, know, you know what I'm saying? So, but anyways, going you back to it. You had a great quote about uh, Manning and Brady and the Hall of Fame induction Oh, speech. yeah, yeah. Well, that was uh, – well, Tom Manning, Manning's pretty yeah. – uh, pretty funny obviously everybody knows Manning and uh they would ha- they had the matchups where they were in the AFC championship five years in a row and one one of the pregames you know Manning gave the uh response were like what's it like when you go up against Brady he's like well you know I don't really go up against Tom Brady I go up against the defense and that's uh you know so I don't think of it as me competing against Tom Brady I got to beat the defense you don't play safety and they asked Brady the same thing he's like yeah I want to kick Manning's ass absolutely I see every pass he makes and I need to make I need if he's if he goes 17 for 19 I'm going 18 for 19 and that's that's, the, that's, that's the, that was, the difference in mentality that was deflection on Manning's play. oh for he was sure against Brady. Oh, because sure. man by the way Manning is super competitive even yeah. from Tennessee when he came out the guys People forget how good I think Peyton Manning was. Like, like, yeah. there, he, two, I think it was 2004. He threw 490 passes and had 49 touchdowns. One out of every 10 passes he threw went for a touchdown. The dude yeah, was unreal. He's, he's great, no doubt. He's uh, now is he connected to the mob? Is that where we're going with Manning? That? Yeah, that's yeah. kind of. There's the, anyone that's there's, not connected there's, to the mob. It's the, hey, white only, bread, whole There's only one Peyton way Manning. Eli Manning beats uh, <laughs> beats old Tommy so are you, touchdown are you, are you, twice. Are you, are you a Giants guy? Are you a Yankees guy? Are you a, I, was what, a, I was a Jets guy most okay. of my life. I I'm went sorry, to Michael. Yeah, I nobody's know. perfect, huh? Well, you know what? I I'm a loyal guy but I left the team because of management they just never put a good team on the field mm-hmm. for how many years so you're a Jets guy yeah you, what uh, Knicks? now, now, now let, let me tell well, you you're, something. you're an island guy are you a Ranger guy or an Islander I, I don't like hockey I'm not a big hockey guy so he I, doesn't I like really, the cold yeah but I'll tell you what happened you know with my work with the uh, NFL I uh, I visited the, the uh, Patriots and I spent time with them, addressed the team, and I became a huge Patriot fan because mm. I love Belichick. I met Brady. Uh, and Matt Patricia, who is a defensive coordinator, became mm-hmm. a good friend. And that would get me killed in New York faster than quitting the mob. Wow. You cannot be a Patriot <laughs> fan in yeah. New York. That's for sure. Yeah. How long ago was that visit? Uh, about three years ago. Oh, yeah, so Three, this four is, years ago. This yeah, is current. The height of Appreciate Brady, everything. Broke yeah. my heart yeah. when the tuna went to... Uh, to the Patriots, the tuna with the Patriots yeah. just never sat ourselves. Right. Yeah, the big tuna. Man. Yeah, and yeah. I got to tell you, Brady, uh, he sat in the front row and he asked some very intelligent questions. He was, uh, I, I just got a lot of respect for him, not right. only on the field. And were you a Yankees guy, Mets guy? Diehard Yankee fan. Okay, diehard. What's the scene in? Uh... Speaking of, congratulations to Derek Sanderson Jeter. Number oh, two, Derek, yes. Derek Jeter yeah, going yes. to the Hall of Fame. You know who showed up to his uh, to his uh, ceremony? All his girlfriends. Michael Jordan. <laughs> oh, yes. Jordan. Jordan. Jordan and Patrick Ewing showed up. Wow. Like, can you imagine? Wow. Like Jordan shows up. You're not even in his That's game. Awesome. Yeah. He shows up to your ceremony. Well, well, he's were, recently divorced, what, and like Adam said, where Jeter goes, uh, right. you know, party treats follow. What was the scene in Bronx Tale? Where uh, De Niro says yes, to his Mickey Mantle doesn't pay your bills. Mickey yeah. Man, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mickey Mantle doesn't throws pay your bills. Well, that wasn't De Niro. That was Chaz Palminteri. <laughs> that was Chaz oh, Palminteri. Oh, Chaz Palminteri. Okay, gotcha. to, what are you crying? Respect. You cry. yeah. Yeah. Bill Mazeroski made Mickey Mantle cry. Yeah. Milky Mickey Mantle cry? Yeah. That car today. Your father can't pay the bills. That's that Mickey Manny. That car today graded PSA 10 is worth 20 
$20 million. $20 million mm. for Three of baseball them left card? in the world. Bro, when you tell me these stories, it's amazing, man. I used to put baseball cards in the spokes of my of my, uh, my yeah. 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 Bike, bicycle. Not bro. Mickey Mantle, like, though. No. Man, nobody like, puts Mickey Mantle in the corner. I had a Ron, Mickey my Mantle made was a Ron Yankee Gant card. Fan. He Tell was us like about my that. idol. I, I love Mantle. He was my idol. He made me a Yankee fan. More than DiMaggio as an Italian, really? Yeah, well, I was younger with DiMaggio. But gotcha. Mantle was my, you know, was my guy. Why though? What, 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 what kind of a player was he? Like, how did he win the fans over? He just, you know, everything about him. I mean, he was a five-tool player. He could do everything right. If that guy was healthy, if he didn't have the knee problem and all, you know, the ailments that he had, if you saw his routine in getting ready for a game, you wouldn't believe it. But I, I guess what happened, I was at Yankee Stadium one time, the old stadium, and Mantle uh, hit two home runs. They were playing Detroit. He hit two home runs, and he made two catches in center field that I can, if I close my eyes, I can see it. Both of them were over the head like this, right up against the wall. Just kept running straight for the wall and made that catch. I, I don't know how he did it. He, he never looked back. Never looked back. He, you were at that game? I was at the game. Wow. Yeah. So you my watch Man, you watch Mantle play. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's my dad, pretty my sick dad to be able to say that. Many times. Now, you were a Brooklyn guy and you liked the Yankees. You weren't a Dodger guy. No, no, no. You know why? Because whenever when they left Brooklyn, all I ever heard was those effing Dodgers. <laughs> you don't leave Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. Everybody turned on him. As but soon as they my left. grandmother prayed for Gil Hodges every day for us. Yeah, life. well, <laughs> so. it, it was it was a good guy. It was, it was a good uh, manager for the Mets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, yeah. Michael, who's your top five all time baseball? I mean, I know this is off topic, but you said Mantle. So what do you what do you I put Mays? May, oh, Mays Mays was you know amazing. Too. Did you watch Mays? Mays uh, I seen Mays play. Yeah, you've seen yeah. Mays play. Yes. I mean, yeah. you, that's well. We talked about yeah. this. I know we did. Yeah, I'm curious the, to know what he's going to say. Well, the, yeah. one, one of the things about yeah. Mays that a lot of people don't know. So some of the old timers that uh, that I used to talk about. Four fifty. Like, 600, 660 home runs. They're like it doesn't even do him justice. Yeah. He played in the Polo Grounds. It was four fifty to dead center. That's and right. then he went out to San Francisco where he had to deal with Gale Force winds blowing in from yeah. left field his whole career. Yeah. Yeah. He, so, he was he was amazing. So you got Mantle, you got Mays, you got Jeter. I love Jeter. I mean, how could you okay. not like Jeter? Jeter was the the player of the moment. Whenever you needed something, he was there. Mr. Clutch. November. Yeah. He who, was, who rounds out your top five? Oh gosh, that's hard. I mean, they were for, for me. They were all Yankees because I'm a diehard Yankee fan. But I, I can recite the whole, you know, Yankee team. You know, scouring. I, I don't want to go into it because it makes me sad. But I miss them. But because uh, I'm so disappointed in that. And now, uh, God, yeah. the way they're playing. Now, yeah, George is probably terrible. rolling over in his grave. They oh, got no heart. Did you ever meet Steinbrenner? I met Steinbrenner twice. With How my was dad. that? Yeah, I loved the guy. Loved him. I mean, he didn't take any nonsense. Was he off camera like how he is on great, camera? Great guy off camera. Okay. Yeah, is he, he like a Trump he, personality? Yes. Okay. Big hearted guy. Yeah. You, you described him right. Just like Trump. Big hearted guy. Mm -hmm. But nothing intimidated him. He didn't care how great a player you were. He wanted to get the most out of them. And he uh, motivated them in any way that he thought. And it was very effective. Who's the Very skipper? Different. He fired two or three times. Oh, Billy, Martin. Billy Martin. Oh, Billy Martin. Yeah. Yeah. It's great Billy when they Martin. went out. And then yes. uh, Yogi <laughs> tried to do the same thing with Yogi, and, and Yogi said he'd never go back. Now, Yogi Berra, mm -hmm. five foot eight, ten World Series, one of the greatest catchers of all time. Right. I mean, how could you not love One him? of the greatest wordsmiths of yeah. all time. <laughs> yeah. Comedian. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, nobody goes there anymore. It's too busy. Wait, yeah. ten <laughs> World Series championships? or Yes, ten. ten World Series. Yogi's got ten. ten. Yogi Berra. And, Yogi's and got about ten. humility. Right, humility to move to the outfield because Elston yeah. Howard was coming up Holy as a catcher. Moly. Five foot eight. That's a Short time guy. when the Yankees were absolutely beloved. They were, they were amazing. Like the, the whole country loved them. Now it's and we, very polarized. Well, Nobody you, loves you, the Yankees. You loved them and hated them. It was one of the right. two. You know, you loved them and hated but, them. But dude, the late nineties were a halcyon time. Also, man, like the the Yankees Red Sox rivalry was just must watch yes. TV. Mm -hmm, I absolutely. cannot tell you the last time I had my calendar marked to watch a baseball game. I love baseball, but I can't tell you the last time. I when was, was like, the last time? What what team got you interested? The Braves. Oh, is man. it is it uh, a player? Was it McGuire Sosa era? Yeah, was McGuire it Sosa ninety eight? Uh, no, you know I I love look I love the game. When I was a kid, the Mets were like unreal. Like the the late eighties Mets were like they were yeah. rock stars. And then eighty six Mets. Dude, you got to remember Ken Griffey Jr. The crossover appeal of Ken Griffey Jr. I mean, imagine kids today Griffey wanting Griffey. to go buy sneakers because of a baseball player. Like nobody even knows who Mike Trout is. You had to have the Griffeys. Yeah. The you kid. had to have the sneakers. The kid. You had to have the swing man. Like you know it, like it's hard enough for these guys to sell yeah. cleats now. I mean, you know, you had to have Ken Griffey Jr. baseball on, on yeah. Super Nintendo. That Griffey game was, was unreal. Great. 
You know, you were then, a big Juan Gonzalez guy. Diehard, diehard Texas Rangers fan. I was a diehard Texas. He was really? six two and a half, two eighteen. I had similar uh, uh, physique, similar swing, and I just loved his game. I, Juan I, Gonzalez. I played with Juan Gon in, in spring training, and I've never wow. seen anybody hit in batting practice. I've never yeah, seen anybody. Did he lost. make you a Rangers fan? Oh, diehard. That's your yeah, really? from ninety one, ninety two. Wow. Oh, yeah. When he came in, because Sosa was a rookie when? 1988-89? Mm-hmm. He was a rookie in 1990. He came, I don't know what it was, second or third year, he had 28 home runs. Mm-hmm. I think he even, I think Sosa got drafted by the White Sox, and then he got traded to the Cubs. And Gonzalez oh. came in, yeah. and I started following Julio him. Julio Franco. Julio Franco yeah. was also. Uh, Kevin Brown. Yeah. Pitch. I have a very controversial uh, statement here on this. Here we go. Steroids were Brace great. Yourself. They were great for baseball. <laughs> they really were. They. I don't know who was hurt by it. I don't know who. These guys were throwing 100 miles an hour, and they were hitting the ball 7,000 feet. It was It was an exciting game. They were running fast. It was hardball. They used to say hardball is back. One of the greatest commercials ever made is Tom Glavin and, uh, and Greg Maddox looking at uh, Michelle Pfeiffer walks past them to get Mark McGuire's autograph, and they go, Chicks dig the long ball. And instead of just pumping it, and they're, they're pumping commercial. it. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I remember that. I remember Chicks that. dig the long ball. Yeah. It was just a great time for sports. Sosa, Maguire hugging it out, but they got those little dinosaur arms because they're so big trying to hug each other. Yeah. It was it was a great spectacle. Listen, I'm he was sorry. emotional when Maguire hit the home run. He picked up his son. Uh, he yeah. comes down. The place yeah, is going true. crazy. The home run almost didn't go, by the way. Yeah. The seven yet. It was just a line drive now, to the left. And none of those guys make it into the Hall of Fame because oh, we're talking steroids. But Bud Selig's in there. Cashing all that paper from all those years, but he ruined the game with the strike. He ruined the game, and then he gets to go into the Hall of Fame because these guys brought it all the way back. Man, I, draw, I think what you're saying is let's make steroids great again. <laughs> Is that what you're trying no, to say? Any kids that are watching this don't do it. But what I'm saying is, is that the guys that did do it, it was a pretty fun product to watch. There's nobody that can tell me that they watched late 90s, early all, 2000s baseball and said, oh, the, the game's better you, you today. Know the, you know the whole thing when they say, like, hey, if I did steroids, I'd also win the Stroll Olympia. I'd also win, you know, be a bodybuilder. Yeah. Oh, if I did steroids. You can do all the steroids in the world. There's yeah. no way you can hit a 95-mile fast ball. <laughs> Barry Bonds. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, where's the controversy? Nobody has yet proven that the steroids – Made you hit more home runs. I mean, really, you, you can't say that for a fact. Yeah, and, and not I mean, for stero- nothing. Steroids helped you get stronger and helped you, you know. But right. and the pitchers can also pitch fast. That yeah, was right? the other exactly. thing. It's always there was like the hitters, like the pitchers I'll, weren't doing. I'll it. push back a little bit on that. When Gary Sheffield hit a home run on a check swing, <laughs> that's when you <laughs> okay. know something yeah, was up. And, uh, <laughs> Gary just goes, "Bam!" You're like, "Wait, yeah, what the hell just happened?" Was a do you remember ago. that or oh, no? Dude, Wait, I, I, do you remember? I got one even worse. Glenn Allen Hill breaking his bat. And then slamming the bat down in in Chicago, and the ball carries, carries, carries. Well, Glenn Allen Hill was a uh, not. Then that's not to say either of these guys were, yeah, uh, doing anything. Anyway, well, just like wink. Now, why is every <laughs> why is every pitcher now pitching ninety nine, a hundred miles an hour? Yeah, who knows? Not steroids. I think it's more. You, you can get away more with uh, uh, HRT today, uh, growth hormone, than you can with steroids. Yeah. It's easier to get yes. away with growth hormone today. Yes, there's some, you know, people, uh, conspiracies out there about LeBron, what he's on, how he takes care of his body. It's not creatine doing that. You know, it's not the yeah, amino acids yeah. doing that. There's something that's going something on there going that maybe on. we don't know about. Yeah. But uh, it is what it is. I mean, listen, I, I don't mind LeBron staying healthy to play 20-plus years. I think it's I better for it. sports. Yeah, you know, I'd much rather get him 20 years than 12 years. So mm-hmm. if you're figuring out a way to keep the youth uh, juice yeah. going where you can, like you, <laughs> you're seven. Juice going. By the way, <laughs> yesterday we're having dinner. I'm sitting there. I order. Uh, what did I order? Bison. Everything. Okay. No, no. I ordered bison. <laughs> you ordered the the, the, the parmesan. parmesan. And also, then, real quick, one of the most baller things I've ever seen in my life. This is the first time in my life I've ever sat down at a table and the food was waiting yeah. for us. That's a Carolina move. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to Carolina. Yeah. The, the the appetizer was waiting, and then Michael, his food shows up. Yeah. And his wife says, "Watch him finish that and finish <laughs> half my plate." Michael, no joke. Quietly, right. he's talking to everybody. This massive bone, I don't know what yeah. it was, yeah. right? Triceratops. He, he finishes yeah. that, then it finishes, and, he's, and then Sweets comes, yeah, I guess I'll try a little bit of this. And <laughs> then that, that's gone, and then the next thing, you know, dessert. Yeah, anyways. Well, he it? said something to me in the middle of dinner. He goes, yeah, I, I, I probably, I, get, I eat a lot. I could probably eat more than Gerard. <laughs> that's... 
I, I'd yeah. go toe to toe with him with, without I mean, a doubt. And, right. and yeah. his wife said, "You heard that? We Michael Francis wants to go toe to toe with you." Uh, Gerard yeah. finished the dessert, took it home. On the way home, he finished it, and then he ran <laughs> yeah. two miles this morning on the beach. Yeah, man. The bus yeah. boy's cleaning up the plates. Ah, da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I was, yeah, ta- I was talking too much. Pat goes, "Keep eating your sweets." <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, can we get this guy a muffin or something? Right, so, so we got something we're going to reveal today for the first time. We're going to show some footage today from Rudy Sick. Giuliani Ooh. from Mafia States of America on what was said about Mario Cuomo. And you reached out to the Cuomo camp to I see did. if Andrew Cuomo had anything to say about that. They, Multiple times. They, they, they did not want to respond. It turns out he had some other things to deal with. To, to yeah, extracurricular to activities. Yes. But, they, you know, we won't go there. So, Michael... First of all, why don't we uh, uh, go and talk about the uh, sit down with you and Sammy, okay? Mm-hmm. We talked about this for a while. You know, it was going to happen. It wasn't going to happen. Mike, Sammy didn't want to do it. You didn't want to do it. And then you guys spoke. And it's like, let's see if we can do it. And then we had a few calls together. Uh, uh, what got you to a point to finally want to do this? I'm sure millions of people have been asking about when is this going to happen. But what made you say, you know what, let's do this sit down? You know, First of all, a lot of people wanted it, it seemed. You know, I would get it. For some reason, it was even before the thought was even, you know, moving around to to sit with him. People were saying, you know, what's your feeling about Sammy? Do you ever going to sit down with him? Was he the real deal? And what do you think about the murder? I mean, I I got so many Sammy questions. So, you know, I was just I was sitting with my wife and I said, you know, maybe I'll talk to Sammy and we'll see if we can put this together. And that's that's really how it happened. And then when we did it, you guys, you, you brought your camp. Yeah. He brought his camp. You guys were in two different, you know, properties. We had you on this side. We had Sammy on this side. And the whole thing starts. How would you think it went? I mean, first of all, we have how many hours of footage? We have a... Uh, Including the drone footage, we've every, got 26 hours. 26 hours of footage, of which, let's be honest, 70% is Sammy. I was going to say 24 80. hours with Sammy talking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how did you think it went? You know, I mean, look, I'm glad it happened. You know, you know... There's so much nonsense going on in the internet right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, guys are just coming out of the woodwork, you know. A lot of them I never even heard of before. But, um, look, there, there was a uh, – Sammy and I were really a part of that life on the level that we were on. He was the underboss. I was a couple at that time. And even though things – you know, Sammy did what he did, I did what I did, there's still a certain amount of respect there. It's just – you just feel it inside, you know. Even though we both are out of the life, he disagrees on that for some reason. He still thinks he's Cousin Austria. I said, "You want to walk down the streets of Brooklyn with me and let's see how Cousin Austria?" Are. But, but um, why? What would happen if he walked down the streets of Brooklyn? Well, I'll leave that up to you to oh, <laughs> think they, about. Uh, for, yeah. Yeah. Brooklyn, Strike that question for uh, the uh, change. Okay. Some some uh, guy from Iowa named Todd uh, with yeah. neck tattoos who tried to serve him a milk latte. Okay, but I, I can't explain it. You know, there's still. Speaking to him, there's a certain amount of respect that I feel, you know, and I think he felt the same for me. So that came out, you know, and, and, and these sit downs, you know, it's amazing, Patrick. You can be away from the life for me now, what, 20 some odd years. But sometimes I'll get off a plane in, in New York and the feeling comes right back. I, it's like I never left. And when I sat down with Sammy, I almost felt the same way. We were at a sit down, and there's a level of respect that you have for one another, regardless of what either one of us did. And I think it came out during that. I mean, he got a little testy. We we both got a little testy at some point, and uh, you know, I had to remind him he's not the underboss anymore. You know, just calm down. And and he said some things to me, and we both said some things, you know, at different times about each other that weren't, you know, very nice. But I think uh, all in all, it went pretty well. Yeah, I, mean, I, I showed, uh, obviously there's a lot of different uh, 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 sections to the interview, but there was a part when I showed a clip with you and Mike Tyson where I, I asked Sammy, I said, Sammy, I want to show you video with what Michael said about you with on Mike Tyson just to see what reaction would be. And it was a clip of you saying uh, uh, Sammy had, uh, what was it, Napoleon Syndrome, well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Napoleon uh, Complex. Gotti, Napoleon yeah, Complex. Gotti on his best yeah. day. Napoleon Gotti yeah. on his worst day was better. Yeah. Gotti on his worst day was better than Sammy on his best day. And how how much has that changed from that comment being made on Tyson to now after having that uh, two days, two and a half days we spent with Sammy? Well, you got to understand something. You know, prior to me sitting down with Sammy, I spent a lot of time with my dad. And the talk about Sammy, you got to be honest, was not good. You know, from guys, especially guys like my father, who would never say a word about anybody. To the, he'd rather die, you know, a hundred deaths and say a word about anybody. So 
to guys like my father, Sammy was a bad guy. You know, that's why it. though? Why? Because of what he did with John. I mean, you know, look, testified against Gotti, testified against a whole bunch of guys. So the word on the street with respect to that was no good with Sammy, and especially from my dad. And he didn't know Sammy. You know, he never met him, but. So he didn't have a, a personal relationship with him in any way. But what he did, you know, on the street was no good. So Gotti, look, Gotti was not an easy guy to get along with. He was a narcissistic type of guy. I got along with him when I had to. I had a couple of disputes with him. Um, but he was a stand-up guy at the end of the day. I mean, he went to jail. He didn't talk about anybody, and that was it. And on the street, that matters. That matters. So that's why I made that comment. You know, it strictly pertained to that. But look, I got to know Sammy now. It's a different story. And he had his reasons for doing that. I'm not going to judge it anymore. And, um, you know, he's trying to turn his life around. I see how he is with his family. He's great. So, you know, who am I to judge? You know, look, we were all on the street. We all did the things that we did. Maybe some guy did a little bit more than another guy. But we're all guilty of that. And, you know, I've come to that, you know, conclusion and realization. So I don't want to talk about anybody uh, Sammy and I are different. We have a different, you know, way of looking at all of this. And I think it came out, mm -hmm. you know, in the sit down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. Time. The Michael, what, prior to the sit down that you did with Patrick and Gerard and obviously with Sammy, how many times had you met Sammy in person? And how many times have you met Gotti in person prior to the sit down? Well, I, I met Gotti several more times than Sammy, you know, back in the day. Um, I, we met Sammy one time. That's it. That was it. So this was your second time meeting Sammy that was in your entire life. Sammy that was, was Sammy uh, 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 straight up feared like he would sit there. Was he a dialogue guy or was he a guy that would just sit there, focus on you and watch every move and extremely paranoid, skeptical? What was uh, Sammy known for back in the days, not today? You know, Sammy's got a sense of humor. He's very charming. Yeah, he, absolutely. Yeah. Great, great storyteller. Very, I mean, he's, oh yeah. he's engaging to very. be around. There's no yeah. doubt about it. I mean, I enjoyed the time we spent. We spent several hours together. I went out to Arizona to see him. We spent several hours together. Um, you know, look, he had a reputation on the street, no doubt about it. And we heard things about him. Again, it wasn't my personal involved with, involvement with him. But uh, I don't want to get into all of that now because we do get into it when we sit down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. So okay, yeah. let's talk about the, you, you brought up your da dad, Sonny. Uh, 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 we, you and I met with him multiple times. Yes. We went to New York and we we're trying to do something with him. And one time we had the whole crew there. We were at the, uh, uh, the not hospital. I don't know what you would call that. It was the Veterans Hospital. Veterans actually, Hospital yeah. we were at. And talking to him. And so I'm driving him in the car. And I'm, we're going to this Italian restaurant. I don't know if you remember the, what the name of the Italian restaurant was. It. Yeah, so we go to this Italian restaurant. The lady's really nice who owns the shop. She's taking care of us, being good to us. And every time I ask your dad a question, hey, Sonny, what, what, do you, what was it like? What was uh, Lucky like? Fantastic guy. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. Great family guy. <laughs> Sonny, <laughs> Lucky's got a history. Great guy. Was always respectful. How about Meyer? They said he was a billionaire. What do you think? Was he that kind of a guy? He had money? I have no, I have no idea, but great guy. Phenomenal guy. <laughs> so I said, how about, how about Ben Siegel? How was Ben? Another great guy. <laughs> yeah. So I said, Sammy, so all the movies are lying. Sonny, all the movies are lying? These are great people that I de dealt with. I said, Sonny, why don't we do the interview? So you tell the world who you were rather than the world telling everybody who you were. I don't want to do that. Why don't you want to do that? So one time I went there, you weren't there, your sister was there. Mm -hmm. They were upset. You know, she was upset. She was like, you know, because, you know, I think I had like two or three meetings. Mario was there. Mario pulls up. His dad looks at Mario's like, who are you? <laughs> Mario says, and by the way, at 101 when we first met him, presence like yes. a man you've 101? never... 101? He died at 103, just wow. so you know that. So that's why you look so good at 70. You you're going to go to 100 easy. Adam, his presence... Unreal at 101. So he goes like this to Mario. Who are you? Mario says, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm here with Patrick. He says, you rat? <laughs> Mario's 101 like, years old. He's, he's asking Mario. <laughs> Sonny Fred's age. So Mario's like, no, no, no I'm not a rat. I'm not a rat. He says, you sure? He says, yeah. He says, you know, 95% of men out there are rats. He says, you going to rat on this guy? He's telling this to Mario. Right on you. Yeah. So first at this meeting. point, first meeting, at this point, wow. it's getting very uncomfortable. Mario's getting uncomfortable. And Mario's he, already changed his pants. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Mario's like, no, no, I said, Sonny, he's a great guy. He says, okay, Linda, Linda, come fix my hair. Come here, Linda, <laughs> grab the comb. So the nurse yeah. comes and she starts fixing it. So why are you doing it that way? Go the other way. You know how I like it. You can tell the man's <laughs> presence Classic. on yeah. how Sonny was. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I knew I, I was fortunate to meet a lot of guys at that time, you know, uh, from Chin to Fat Tony to Castellano, Gaudiola. There was nobody like my dad. I mean it. And I'm not, you know, I'm trying to be as objective as I possibly can. There was really nobody like him. What was your he dad was, like when he was, you know, had, doing his thing? You know, what back was, in the day, yeah. he had, and, and that's why he became such a major target. I mean, what nobody really understands, I mean, if you were around that time, you knew. My dad was the John Gotti of his day before wow. they had, you know, social media and all this kind of stuff. He was a John Gotti. The he, 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 became, and stuff like that. he became such a target of law enforcement. I mean, look, he's indicted four times in the 60s. Media like you wouldn't believe, front page all the time, and he was the guy. And it was his presence, you know, he just had a presence about him back then. You walked into a room, you knew, you know, he was there. That was it. All the focus went on him. You go to the Copacabana, I mean, I was with my dad, I'll never forget, we were in the Copacabana, um, I forget who was playing, I think it was Jimmy Roselli, yeah, it was Jimmy Roselli, and Joe Colombo came in at that time, and my father had to tell the waiters to take care of Joe Colombo because everybody was catering to my father. You know, and catering the people that don't him. know Joe Colombo yeah, was... Yeah, he was the boss. Yeah. And, and I saw him do that a couple of times where all the attention always went to him and somebody else came in the room. He said, hey, take care of that guy. You know who he is? You know, be respectful. Um, he just commanded that kind of presence. If you could summarize your father in, you know, three major words, is there any words that come to mind? You know, charismatic, um, powerful, you know, I mean, those two words, you know, and, uh, and loving. I mean, as a mm. father, he was terrific. Never missed a baseball game of mine. Wanted me to go to college. You know, just a, a good husband at that time to my mom. I mean, he was just an, in the house. He was great. And Loved he was born his kids. in what year? 1920? He was born in uh, 17. Mm. 1970. He was born in Naples. My dad was born in... My grandfather oh, came here. In, yeah, my grandfather came here several years earlier, but he would go back by boat every year to Naples. Yeah, my father was born on a boat trip. He was wow. one of 19 kids, by the way. One of 19? 19. 19 kids. Yeah. No Facebook, no YouTube. No yeah. You had not, nothing else to do. You had nothing else You're to saying do. there was no do. Facebook well, in yeah. 1919? That was one of the crazy parts about the, uh, the interview, frankly, man, was watching two men actually sit there, have a conversation, not look at their phone for 16 straight hours. You see, and, and, and that's, that's the thing. After being with my dad, and he, he taught me a lot. He taught me how to navigate that life. I was never in awe of anybody else. I respected them, no doubt, but I never, you know, Gotti to me was, all right, you know, he's, he tries to be, have that big presence. My father didn't have to try. He just mm -hmm. was who he was. That was it. Big difference. Oh, yeah. So yeah. there's nobody you were in awe of, like, oh, damn, he's here. Nothing? No. No. Mm. Well, let me ask you, the, in, in some of the movies and some of the shows that the, it's been so popularized in pop culture, is there, is there a character that you see and you're like, ah, I think they took that from, from my dad. I think that guy is, is, is kind of playing the, the Sonny Francis role. Here. No, but I'll tell you this. I think the greatest performance of an actor in one of those movies was Armand DeSante in the Gotti movie in 1996. He was tremendous. To me, I, I could watch that movie a hundred times. Guy, can you just pull up Armand DeSante? Good First luck spelling all, the that. The guy is, uh, I mean, maybe one of the best looking guys in Hollywood. He was in Mambo Kings mm -hmm. with Antonio Terrific. Banderas. He crushed it. The guy's mm -hmm. a beast of a guy. And his voice. Judge he, Dredd. He's got a voice. You cannot teach that voice. No. Yeah. Yeah, he's a uh, oh, yeah. stud. How old is he now? He's Gotta about 70. A, 70 late 60s, really? yeah. yeah. Let's see what but he, he like in, in that movie... No, put Armando Asante, not DeSante. Ra this he's putting not, Ron DeSante. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? Not, and then put Gotti. Put Gotti. Guy's from Norway. Yeah. I don't know what part of Italy Go images. That is. Go images to see how he... Is that Travolta? Yeah, that movie Travolta was no Travolta Gotti. It was probably one of the worst movies I've seen in my life. Oh, two God. hours later, I felt like I Travolta wanted a refund of my two hours. <laughs> And Travolta's a great actor. He just didn't get Gotti. And he didn't get no, it. Was he didn't produced get it. By your, it was produced by your friend. It was a great Kai, producer. Kai, go middle, too. middle oh, right, Kevin all the way to the right. Really? Yeah. One no, down, one down. Yeah, that's, it was. All no, the way to the right. Look at this good-looking guy. Right no, no. That, they, by, by the way, yeah. this, this guy is... Sexy Gotti Ula. 
<laughs> Ooh yeah. la la. He's, he's a, but he he wow. ab- well he kills every role that he's in. But he just killed that role in Gotti. Oh, I mean, who else? To, he played Gotti up, better than Gotti. To pick up uh, Gerard's question, who else comes to mind other than uh, Armando Sante? I thought you know next. I thought Pacino in um, Donnie Brasco because mm. I knew I knew uh, Lefty. He, he was terrific. I thought that was his best role. Really? Yes. That yeah, and and obviously, uh, uh, gosh. And we played the Cuban drug dealer. Oh, Scarface? Scarface. I mean, he was great Tony in that. Montana. But uh, Donnie Brasco, he was terrific. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think that guy Pacino is going to do something good in Hollywood. Yeah. I think something's going to come from I think it was Johnny Depp's best role. Let, 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 me, yeah. let me go back to a couple stories, you know, uh, with, with uh, <coughs> your father. Uh, how, how much credit? I know you, told, you, you and I have spoken about this before. Mm-hmm. How much credibility is there behind the story of your dad with Marilyn Monroe? That, that's out there. A lot of people have talked about that before. But how much of credibility is there with the story of him and Jackie? He said he partied with Jackie in Florida. Jackie O? Jackie Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy. Yeah. Him and Jackie apparently used to hang out together. You know, I, I will tell you this. My dad sometimes embellished things a little bit. Yeah. But he never straight out lied to me. So he might have made it a little bit better than it, it really was, maybe. But when he told me something, I believed it. You know, the whole Marilyn Monroe story. I mean, when he finally told me that yeah. was after my mom died. Because I said to him, I said, Dad, why did Bobby Kennedy come after you in such a way? What happened? You know, and he said to me, Mike, now that your mother has passed, I would never be disrespectful to her. I can tell you. And he said he had an affair with Marilyn Monroe. And then this might have been a little bit of embellishment. He said Marilyn Monroe was in bed with Bobby Kennedy, and she started yelling my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sonny. Oh, it's, it was, it's it, was, it, was the, it was the swing in 60s, yeah. baby. Wow. And, and then he said Bobby got on the phone with Hoover and said, get Francis no matter what you got to do. But, oh, man. And that's when all the trouble started. All but, he had to do was run for another year or two. He would have been all right. Yeah, man. That, that was it. But, I mean, I do know he was with her because I said, Dad. He said, no, Mike, straight, straight school. What were your thoughts okay. on, you know, JFK, Bobby Kennedy, even MLK, because that's when you were a kid in your yeah. in your teens. What was that like in that time? The CIA doing some house cleaning? Bobby H- Kennedy I, I had to dislike because my dad always said it was him that went after him and put him in all this trouble. Because remember, Hoover, you know, up until that time, never would even admit that the mafia existed. And the reason for that is because one of the reasons, you know, Frank Costello was involved with the store club. Hoover used to go in there quite a bit, and they had a lot of dirt on him. And we, we do cover this yeah, in Mafia States of America. They had a lot of dirt on him, and uh, he would never even admit to it until Valachi came around. Then he had to admit to it, but uh, but he never went after the mob. Yeah, Bobby Kennedy, gloves off, he went after him. Well, mm-hmm. uh, you guys, if it's all right if I say, you and Sammy both uh, talked about the mob's involvement in, in the JFK assassination as well in this yes. upcoming. And you had said that you two had never spoken, you had never talked about it before, no. and you corroborated each other's story. And it was almost the exact same story. I heard it all my life. I mean, why would people lie to me about it? You know, from the right people. And what I, what I believe is the classified documents about the Kennedy killing will never be revealed because the government will never want the public to know that the mafia got to a sitting president. That's my belief. I don't think they'll ever be unclassified. Trump tried to. Or he was going to, and then they put a stop to it. Well, Biden just is gonna, apparently going to uh, declassify the 9-11, 9/11. Uh, yeah. report as well. So you have, to, to Adam's point, you have Marilyn Monroe dying in very, very, uh, very interesting circumstances. Mm-hmm. Do you drug believe, overdose. Yes, yeah. but drug overdose apparently after a phone call to the White House. So okay. basically, there were some extra the, the well, there, it's pretty well known that her and Jack Kennedy, and then Jack said, yeah. passed her off on her on his brother Bobby, mm-hmm. uh, because she called one night and Jackie answered the phone, and it was like a whole thing. Imagine that you're the president of the United States and you still got a landline. There were no cell phones back then, man. Wow. And you know, Marilyn Monroe's calling the White House, has the White House line, and Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Yeah. First Lady, it's so, just the phone. So I don't growing, care up, like growing up, I had a poster of Pamela Anderson on my wall. I was a 16-year-old kid. Pamela Anderson. Was Marilyn Monroe like that girl for you? No. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, she died in the 60s. I was still a kid. Okay. But, uh, well, no. right, well, well get, yeah. just to get back on it, so just real quick, do you think the Kennedys had Marilyn Monroe killed? You know, rumors all the time, but I never heard anything from any of my associates at the time that that was true. And do you think the mob had anything to do with Bobby as well as Jack? No, I never heard that either. Really? No. Only Jack. 
Really? So, yes. so what do you think about Serhan Serhan? You know, it's all over the news. That they're going to let him out? Yeah, that they're going to let him out? You know, listen, you know, from a guy that's done time, and, and look, I've either been in prison or visiting prison my entire life. This guy did a lot of time. Mm-hmm. If he's rehabilitated and they believe he has, let him out. For those of you that, that, that don't know, the murderer of Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Sir Hunt, Sir Hunt, was which, just which, let out of jail. And also, for people that don't know, Bobby Kennedy was a shoe in to be the president of the United States of America. Yeah, of course. Absolute shoe. Yeah. The level of momentum he had was, was unbelievable. Shoe yeah. 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 And maybe even more qualified than his brother. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot of people think his brother was the real brains behind the operation, but uh, Jack just had that charisma. And Bobby was what, the attorney general at the yeah. time? Yeah. Yep. Mm. Well, according I, to I you were talking about Bobby, about Bobby coming down on on the mafia. According to Rudy, uh, when Colombo did the anti Italian Italian anti defamation league, that's that was the Italian American Civil Rights League. That was right. when the entire FBI apparently was like, "All right, enough of this. We got to go get these guys." Well, I was one of the first ones called to go on that line, and that that thing started just several months after my dad was went to prison. Was that like the Black Lives Matter of its time? Was that like yeah? I mean, we were a little bit more respectful. That we didn't start rioting and looting and doing all of that. Well, you weren't but, commies. No, <laughs> we got a call to go down to 69th Street and Third Avenue and pick at the FBI building. And when I got there, I mean, I was a kid. I was you know, like 20 years old. When I got there, um, they handed me a sign, and the sign said, "My father was a victim of FBI Gestapo tactics." He was framed and sentenced to 50 years in prison. That was the sign I had to carry. That's not leaving a lot for interpretation. No. <laughs> and that, that line grew from, you know, I mean, 40, 50 people the first or second day to thousands, thousands within a short period of time. I mean, Joe Colombo rallied the troops, no doubt. And everybody on the line, all the made guys on the line were very upset. They didn't want to be there. They didn't want to be there. You know, it got so bad, the FBI was so upset, they were throwing water balloons down from from you know, the FBI was yes. throwing water balloons, water balloons down on us <laughs> on the line. Yeah, that's how crazy. It well, got. according to Giuliani, that was like the last straw. That was yeah. like the okay. Oh, you guys, you guys want to do this? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that was not a popular move uh, within the mob circles for Joe Colombo. Let me ask yeah. you, Pat. You've interviewed how many mafia people of that life? I, I don't know. Anybody that I could, I have. Yeah. yeah. When did you this interest come up in your life? That Obviously, a kid from Iran, you weren't watching yeah. the good, you know, Godfather. No, but you did, though. Oh, did you? I mean, Godfather in Iran was like, everybody watched the Godfather. Wow, even oh, yeah. in Iran. In Farsi. Okay, oh, in Farsi. In Farsi. Farsi. Yeah, that's So, it. yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, so, no, we grew up watching that. We grew up watching all of that. And then... You know, uh, Bronx Tale, Carlito's Way, Scarface, mm-hmm. you add all of them up. Any one of them. Goodfellas, Casino. There's a level of curiosity, you know, what's happening. Because everything in business and in the mob, it's very, very similar. The only difference is if you cut somebody, they don't kill you. They <laughs> may terminate your contract. They may you know, no longer do business with you. They may do whatever they can to put you out of business, which is a form of a lawsuit, but they're not going to come and kill you, right? But everything else is very similar. Well, you you heard Pat talk at the vault, I mean, about systems, about discipline, about uh, organizational structure. I mean, literally almost nobody did it better. Culturally, safety, uh, how uh, the level of respect with women, certain code you followed, sisters, daughters, uh, uh, what? So that created a level of safety if you were in, right? There was a Absolutely. level of safety. So if you create an inner circle in your business, in your company, those who are in it, there's a level of uh, safety. There's a level of additional benefits that comes with that. There's a, so that model is ran by a lot of different people in business. So many similarities. And then, you know, Michael and I, uh, there, there was a, uh, a Bill McIntosh. We got to give him credit because yes. Bill kept saying, Pat, you got to interview Michael. I'm like, uh, uh, Bill, I'm not doing this. He says, Pat, I'm telling you, interview Michael. For a year and a half, Bill from Peru would follow me, asking me to interview Michael. And I kept saying, yeah. no. Finally, we agreed. On my way to Michael's house, I was sitting with Jordan Belfort in Manhattan Beach. Mm-hmm. I tell Mario, Mario, we're late to the next interview. We're supposed to be there at like 4 or 5, 4.30 or something. We show up at 6.30, mm-hmm. and they're supposed to go to a church the function. Church, yeah. So I'm like, these guys... So Mario says, hey, Michael, we're so sorry. They're on their way. They're on their way. I'm dealing with L.A. traffic. Finally, we get there. An interview that was never supposed to happen. At that time, Michael's, you know, uh, we are, we're, I don't know how many subs we had at that time, 500,000, 450,000, some number like that, right? 
and Michael doesn't have a lot of views online. He's got 500,000 view videos, 300,000 view videos. He's done some stuff. And then we do the interview. Mm -hmm. We post it. We don't think much of it. Next day, Michael's like, hey, Patrick, can you tell me what's going on? I said, Michael, you're on the cover of World Star. He says, what are you <laughs> yeah. talking about? So the interview goes World on Star. World Star, picked up by World Star. Everybody starts contacting us about this interview. It takes off. Now it's got, I don't know, 12 plus a million, Something about to cross like 13 that. million yeah. views. And, uh, and so that led to the next interview. And I don't know who, I think we did another part to you and I. Yeah, uh, at, in we got, Dallas, we got well over we, twenty some odd million. Views. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, listen. I mean, now Michael's got stuff that he did with BuzzFeed. He's all over the place. Michael mm -hmm. has done Wired, but I don't. You got everything now. You yeah. got your channel that's about to cross a million subs. You guys are crushing mm -hmm. it with your crew. Uh, they you guys got there. Then Sammy, we did the interview with Sammy, and uh, Sammy was uh, uh, extremely difficult to get that done. He just <laughs> didn't want to get on camera. Sammy didn't want to get on camera. He says, "You think I'm gonna sit with you?" I sat with Diane Sawyer in 1994. <laughs> I'm going to do one of these YouTube things. <laughs> like now Sammy. you can't get him now off. Now he's doing YouTube <laughs> left and right. <laughs> now you can't get yeah. him off. <laughs> but talk about that. How You, yeah, you from go from being on 2020 to, YouTube. to a YouTuber. How does that happen, Michael? I, I, don't, I don't know, honestly. It's, it's the cra you know, sometimes I, uh, I'm in bed laying down at night, and I'm saying, what am I doing with this YouTube? <laughs> You know? It's a powerful tool, man. Right. Yeah. It is. You know, yeah. you, you know things got real when you said, if you like that, there's another clip over here. And if yeah. you'd like the channel, please subscribe yeah. and smash that thumbs up. Not, what are we talking about over not here? Not only that, I'm t almost every other day I go on YouTube and there's somebody else. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know. It's a whole genre. Yeah, but, people but, go crazy. But we're for saturating it. But Michael, the it's now. really only two people that are, you know. Yeah. So, there, of course, there is a lot. But. You know, when it comes down to this genre, it's two people. I know John is thinking about doing some rumor on the street is John is thinking about doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, so Which if John? No, he uh, is doing junior? something. Yeah, I know he the is. The Witchek Mafia he's doing. But I don't know what angle he's going to take. I don't know how. They, he, he's got some people on his team that are yes. quality people. We've had a couple conversations with them in the past, not today. When we did the Sammy interview, we had some right. exchange there. But uh, it's not going to be a camp that's going to have a lot of people there. And the Sammy's interview's now got 12 plus million views. So both yeah. of them 12 plus. So you got Sammy 12 plus million views, Michael 12 plus million views. He's about to cross 13. Now we have Mafia States of America. So yeah. it's not like individuals. So Sammy calls Michael out. Then Michael calls Sammy out. And it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, nonstop. Like Michael would say something and something. But what are you saying there? What's your point with that? And then Michael, Sammy would say something. But Sammy, I disagree with you. And they, mm -hmm. so the, you, this, like Chaz Palminteri says, Patrick, I don't know if you understand this. This has never happened in a history of a uh, of, uh, 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 mob. This has never happened. So, and I got a phone call I got, I'll tell you about afterwards, a very interesting phone call that you and I will talk about uh, right after. I was going to bring it up to you yesterday. There was too many people around, but I'll talk to you about it afterwards, what happened. Sure. Very strange people have contacted me mm. about this interview because everybody wants to know. And then... The trailer. So now people are asking, when is this coming out? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a date yet. You know, we're trying to figure out when we're going to launch it. People want it to come out tomorrow. People drive me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, I don't know. Yeah. Speak to Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> it's big. It's bigger than than the mafia genre, though. I mean, this is this is a history. This is an America that doesn't exist. Oh, I anymore. think they, they're going to watch this a hundred yeah, years this from is, now. Yeah. They have to. Yeah. I mean, this is a time mm -hmm. capsule. This is the what I got out of this, and from the research that we're doing from the project, man, is that that this is the story of immigrants making their way in America. You could be uh, uh, the mafia is identified with Italian Americans, but as we got into it, you talked about Bugsy Siegel. You talked about Jewish, the the Jewish immigrants in the, in the beginning in New York were the ones that taught the other immigrants. We talked about this. Then there was the Irish Westies, and then the the Ita but nobody took it to the level the Italians did. I mean, the Russians and, no. and the Chinese maybe, but well, no, I'm going to tell you this. You know, when you talk about mafia, Cosa Nostra in this country, you got to understand we survived and prospered for almost 100 years under some difficult conditions. I mean, we always had law enforcement after us. But why? Because we had structure, we had discipline, we had authority, and we had respect among one another. And, and there were some pretty intelligent guys there. You know, I always say this, you know, you know who made the mafia in this country, who gave us the biggest advantage? Prohibition. The government. Yeah. Prohibition. Because yeah. of prohibition. Because that's when the money came in. Mm -hmm. That's when we started getting the money, and you don't do anything without money. And you were advocates. You were advocates for the people at that point. The people didn't want prohibition. No, you were advocating not. for the public. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. Absolutely. Are there any similarities to, to, to today? Prohibition was in the twenties, right? So now it's a hundred years later. 
Are there any comparisons today to what the government is doing to manifest a certain marketplace? Like, is Bitcoin See, the I, new prohibition? It's like, a what's good that question, correlation? Because I have a Russian friend mm. who says when the government goes, we're talking about like government overreach and tyranny and online yeah. and everything like that. He was like, it's no problem for Russians. We just go black market. They can do whatever they want. We'll go. Russian, Russians are very smart, but you know, uh, I, you don't want to get me started. I'm writing a book. I want you to get started. Democracy, <laughs> mafia <laughs> democracy, because. I am telling you that our government today is acting very Machiavellian, just like the ideology that we followed on the street. And the other thing I wanted to say, remember, all these other groups, I mean, you got to give them credit, but, you know, you take the cartels in, in uh, you know, Mexico, South America, they're built around drugs. You take drugs away, that's it. They got nothing. Mm -hmm. But we infiltrated every sector of society. From the guy on the street with the numbers business right up to the White House mm. and everything in between. Wow. And you, you know this, Patrick. You control the unions in this country. You control the country. At Still least, to today? Yeah, that's think? literally what the not, Democrats not, are doing. Not as much. Literally right now. Not today because they took a lot of the union power away from us. But mm -hmm. look, you control the Teamsters. You got two and a half million truck drivers. You call a strike. The country stops. Which? You call a strike at the docks. Nothing comes in and out of To his country. point, what did they just <laughs> do in Australia? To, uh, to, to compete against these vaccine mandates, the truckers shut down the roads. They stopped on the bridges. They at, All at the same time, sure. they shut the country down. And within 24 hours, South Wales in Australia went from mandatory vaccinations to uh, non-mandatory to, yeah. to what do they consider? Uh, what, it was, uh, and it's legit. You call a strike, it's legit. They can't do anything to stop you until, until you negotiate and they reach a point of uh, a conclusion. But you have that kind of power. You know, in politicians, you've got these huge pension funds. Mm -hmm. You know, politicians are drawn to money. You, you know that, Patrick. They're drawn to money. When you control that type of, of uh, when you have that type of control, you've got a lot of authority. Who has more power in America than the NEA right now? The, the, exactly. the Education Association you know, you know, runs yes, the country. It's funny. Yesterday I spoke to uh, Captain Dennis Tager, who is the spokesperson for the largest union for pilots in America, 15,000 pilots. It's called APA, Allied Pilots Association, right? And he was talking about uh, 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 the difference between union today versus before. You know how Jimmy Hoffa union before mm -hmm. versus today. How different is today's union than before? Has it changed much or is it still similar kind of influence and power? Good question. Uh, it, it's changed a lot because the mob doesn't have the control over it as it did before. Okay. You know, and the numbers are down in the unions. Numbers are down, I think. You know, back... You know, in my day, unions were powerful, man. We look. I had. When you say numbers are down, you mean percentage of Americans who are part of unions? Well, yes. One, one out of th as late as the 1960s, one out of every three Americans was in a union. And now, now I gotta suspect it's less than 10. You know, well, it's, it's no that? because it's it's 40 uh, percent because almost 90 percent of all government employees are unions. There's almost uh, no private sector unions. Yeah. They're all public sector now. Patrick, mm -hmm. I had control through a guy by the name of Danny Cunningham. We had the um, uh, security union, right? We had, we had security at nine nuclear power plants in the country. Now, in those nuclear power plants, I don't know if you know, at that time, when a nuclear plant closed down, you had to have security there for 100 years. What? 100 years. Why? When it was closed. Why? That's what the government said. You got to have huh. security there for 100 years. Whoa. Danny oh, Cunningham. That's, 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 so that's, so that's, that's a good contract Michael, to get. He, he, um, question for you. Why, why were most of you in the mob Democrats when you were in the life, but Republican or, you know, independent, center right, you know, whatever you want to call it, once you guys left the life. I, that's kind of uh, interesting to me. I keep talking to guys where, you know, even Leonetti, you know, even uh, uh, Sammy, some of these guys, well, Leonetti is still on the uh, uh, Democrat, but why were some of these guys Democrats when you were in the life? What happened? What changed? Well, I think with Trump, because Trump is a New Yorker and he's yeah. got that way about him, yeah. we're attracted to him. For right. me, it's about his policies, but I won't get into that. But on the street, we hated the Republicans because they were the law and order uh, party. Mm. Got it. The Democrats were easier to corrupt. Every politician that we knew that we corrupted, <laughs> they were all Democrats. Every single well, one. What, unpack that. What do you mean by that? 
you know, guys that we had on a payroll, guys that would do us favors, guys that got me licenses for my gas business. They were all Democrats. So if you if you went up to a Republican and say, listen, I need a gas license, what would they say to you? Or did you not we, even approach We didn't do it. We didn't approach Because you really? knew there they were There's plenty of Democrats around to do it. So you, this you is had in the 80s? When is this? Yeah, 80s. 70s, 80s. Yeah, all the way through. But dude, the, the, the start of the Democratic Party with Tammany Hall and with Boss Tweed, I mean, the, yeah. the, the big... The big tent idea is, you know, vote early, vote often. Chicago politics. I mean, it's it's pretty well documented, man. You, your your folks are uh, not exactly the most noble creatures walking the yeah, face of the earth. There, it's, it's it's like my dad hated Ronald Reagan. Don't let him bully you, bro. Seriously. Ronald Reagan's a rat. <laughs> yeah, He's right. a rat. He, you know, he goes. He doesn't like Italians. He goes after all the mob guys. Well, dad, that's his job. You know, you know, you're supposed to come after. Oh, your us. dad said that to you about Reagan. Yes. So yeah, your dad was Reagan. a Democrat. Democrat all the way. Interesting. And like I said, the guys that we were closest to, they were all Democrats. So Every Democrats were more friendlier with the mob, and they were okay with looking away and letting you do yes. your thing. So yes. a Hoover, uh, Kennedy, these a bo- yes. these guys were like, listen, you guys do as long as you do your thing and you do us favors, we're gonna leave you guys alone. Joe Kennedy was a was a bootlegger, you know that. Mm-hmm. He yeah. was involved in prohibition. Yeah. He was for, he was close with Costello and a couple of guys that knew him well. That's how this whole deal came together with the Kennedys. You know, I meet Esposito. I mean, it's it's public knowledge now. He was very close to a, a good friend of mine, Fritzy Givinelli, mm-hmm. and another guy I don't want to mention him. He's still around. And, uh, you know, Fritzy was with uh, Chin Gigante. Mead did us a lot of favors. Yeah. Mario Biaggi, the same thing. These guys passed on now. Cuomo. Yeah. Well, yeah. How, much is, sorry, Pat, how much of this is because, for a long time, the unions did represent the working man, and you guys were the working man, and the Democratic Party wanted to represent the working man, and this was part of the fabric of everyday life. Yes. So, you know, it's one thing that they were corruptible, but I'm sure, you know, just to play devil's advocate and, and, and to unbreak Adam's heart, it's like, I, I'm sure, like, in some way there was a wink and a nod, like, yeah. how much more money do these rich Republicans need? How much more money do these robber baron Nixon Republicans need, man? So, I mean, it's like, what am I going to come down on the guy that, what, what's he doing, running numbers? Come on. You know, so, I mean, how much yeah. of it was like that? And don't get me wrong. It wasn't that we were selective. We had to go with a Democrat. We didn't care if you're a Democratic, Republican, Independent, or whatever. It just so happens that the guys that were easiest to get to were, were Democrats. You're saying that you don't care about the red or the blue. You care about the green. Ew. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We didn't care who it was. Right. You know? I'm, I'm interested in the, in the structure you talked about before because, you, you know, you're talking about the, the way that you guys were able to build out, the way that you were able to build out, infiltrate all parts of life, you guys had this corporate structure. The commission was one of the first true C-suite boards in America. But you guys don't have, I'm, I'm assuming you don't have user manuals and there's no orientation. You know, it's not, no. You're not going away on a, on a weekend trip well, to the eventually to was beginning. a user manual. The eventually was a user manual and that's what they used to come after them. A banana? The mm-hmm. banana book yes, was the, the user manual. So he gave that up to everybody. So yes. for years before that, how, how was the structure passed on? It was just word of mouth? or I, I can't imagine there was a mafia or you well, t- look, Congratulations on being a made man. Come this way and we'll teach you your day one on. What's code red in the Marines? I only know because of one of my favorite movies of all time. That's and I'm right. assuming. It's a sick movie, right? Yeah. But code red was a real thing for a long time. But was it, w- it really? Of course it was. Wow. But it's not something that you talk about, right? There's a lot of things, uh, you know, I, I don't know who I was talking to, uh, Michael, that said, you know, the best guy he dealt with, I don't know if it was uh, Sugarman, I don't know who it was. And one of these guys I spoke to, he said, uh, the best gangsters were the ones, like Meyer Lansky never wrote anything down on paper. He was, uh, even Harvey Keitel, when they were, mm-hmm. the movie, he talks about it in there, says right. never write anything down on paper. Everything was here. Exactly. The guys that did it right, they tracked, like, if they knew this guy owed him 10 grand or 20 grand, it wasn't written anywhere like an Excel spreadsheet. Hey, uh, you know, Mr. Director. Uh, it was like, hey, uh, you know what you did last month? Where's that $10,000? What do you mean $10,000? Well, you know, I know what you did. Da, 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 this cat's. So it was a lot of memorization, the guys that did it 100%. right. Mm. So, so you, you almost had to have a certain skill. That's not a duplicatable exactly. skill Patrick, set. I want, to, I want to tell you this, and, and this is the God's honest truth. I never wrote anything down. Before I went to prison, I would never forget a phone number. I would never forget who owed me money. I never forget a name. Never. At that level, you making that, many, that much money and never, you never? Never, never forget anything. When I went to prison, and this is the truth, so many guys would hit me up with deals and stories and this that I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would let it go in one, in one ear, one out the other. When I come out of prison, I couldn't remember a name, a phone number, <laughs> wow. or anything else. 
Wow. And, it, and it stuck. You, you know, were locked years, in. You were in the zone. Locked in. But back, well, back then, in the day. Well, you know, you know what my father not taught me? That's by the way. Right. My yeah. father used to tell me the, the telephone is a cop. That's how you look at the hmm. phone. When we were in my house in Roslyn, Long Island, yep. when my dad wanted to talk to me when he was on parole, he said, come on, let's go. We'd either take a walk, and he would talk to me like this, like a pitcher on the mound. Talk to me like that. Or we would go into the bathroom. He would turn on the faucets. We would lean our heads into the faucet, and he'd be standing there flushing the toilet to make sure that nobody can hear anything. Wow. He ingrained that in me. Wow. I never got caught on a wiretap. I never had any of that stuff that I had to worry about because I looked, I was not, I don't want to use the word paranoid. I was extremely careful. Have, has any of that it. stuck around till today or no? Like, you know how sometimes, you know, like I was born in Iran. So if I hear a certain alarm, like it takes me straight back to Iran. If I 100%. hear a certain noise, is it still in there? Same or? way. And truthfully, crazy, Patrick, yeah. I hate talking on a phone. I, I, I still don't like it. I just, I'm not, I'm yeah, not I mean, comfortable I, that's, with it. I, if yeah. you live that life, there's some I'm of that. Just on your stick. cell phone, you don't. Yeah. yeah. I don't like to talk on the phone. He, you see my, I have very few phone calls. Yep. His dad is saying the phone's a cop and everybody is like, hi, cop. What is the name of, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. serious. So, Google, so, right? But you made a comment about Mario Cuomo. Kai, do you have that video about Mario Cuomo, what you guys talked about as well as what Giuliani said about Mario Cuomo? If you have that, uh, uh, I wouldn't mind because when we were sitting down, go ahead. No, it's great, great. Baseball player as well, Mario Cuomo, for people that don't know. He was a big Yankee prospect. that got one of the biggest signing bonuses of all time at one point. But by the way, he was a guy that was loved and admired by a lot of people, a lot of people from both sides, based yes. on what you read about the yeah. guy, respected. So I asked you guys about Mario Cuomo. Comments came up. It was not necessarily intentional, just kind of came up. And uh, you guys both said, maybe if you want to share it, you guys both talked about how Mario's involvement, it was, you know. Yes, in the mob, it was yes. Uh, he he was friendly with guys on the street, no yeah. doubt. No so doubt. so here's what Rudy said about Mario Cuomo. Kai, if you want to play it, it's uh, 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 by the way, uh, yeah. And with Rudy, we sat down for three and a half hours at his place. Oh, he, if if he could have, he would have kept you there all day. Oh, and if we release what what Giuliani said, oh. I don't, you know, like oh, yeah. some of the stuff yeah. that Giuliani, maybe that may be episode eight, nine, ten yeah. that people have to watch it. Oof. But some of the stuff that he says, it's gonna be, yeah. uh, 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 it's not gonna be good for some <laughs> folks out there. So, but go ahead, play play what Giuliani said about Sammy. The uh, I, many names were brought up, so I asked him. I said, who was easier to bribe? You know, when you were a mobster, was it the Republicans, the Democrats? Who was it? They said. Not even close. It was always easier to bribe and buy, you know, Democrats. I said, give me names. Who, anybody that maybe you work with, they can talk about. And we started kind of going through a list of names. They spoke very favorably about Mario Cuomo, Governor Mario Cuomo. Yeah, I would too. Yeah, and they, they said very good things. But they also said, we had him in our pockets. I, you know, meaning yeah, I the know fact. Why. So you. you, you they, had him, they, had, they, had, they had him in their pocket. Somewhat because of his own um, of his own limitations in his thinking, and somewhat because of his wife. So his wife's family, and I, I hate to say this because she's a lovely woman. I think Matilda is a, just a grand lady, but this is part of the Italian experience. Had mafia connections, and the governor was always afraid that if he ran, they would be exploited. Hmm. And I and I I opposed Mario in the sense of. My political philosophy was completely different than his, certainly at that point in my life. Even though I endorsed him for governor, well, I'll explain why later. I needed the money for the city. Uh, All you need I to know about politics. Interesting there, by the way. Interesting. All you need to know. I don't think, I know, I know and really can't quite describe in detail to you, it wouldn't be right, the, the details of it. And it's not nearly as serious as he thought it was. I mean, it's the kind of thing you could easily explain as had nothing to do with Matilda, had nothing to do with Mario, and it's the kind of thing that happened back in those days when you had to conduct a business, and if you didn't play ball with them, you were gonna, you were gonna you, they were victims. They weren't. They easily could have been interpreted that way. That's the way I interpreted it. Mm. Uh, but he he. He saw shadows about it. You know how sometimes people are more embarrassed about something than they should be? Mm -hmm. I always thought that was the case with Mario. Mm -hmm. Largely because he was very ethical and a very good man. Mario was. Yeah, very, very good man. And uh, someone agree. I respected yeah. greatly. Yeah. Even, though, even though I thought some of his political ideas were outdated, that whole thing about 
you know, there's uh, two Americas, one for the rich, one for the mm -hmm. poor. I think, well, I think that ended during the Depression. And uh, I didn't think if he ran, he would get elected. I thought he could be nominated, but I thought his message was too Kyle, you can outdated. End it there. And, I, and I don't think. He so Thoughts? I, I agree with him. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with him. I mean, he was uh, he was a friend to us. I put it that way. Unlike his son. Oh, <laughs> uh, Andrew, well, he's, he's, it's good to know, though, that he actually isn't, uh, you know, abusive or handsy. He's just Italian. So there's that. <laughs> who, who now? Andrew Cuomo, that's what he said. He didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't abuse any of those women. He's just Italian. We're handsy. Yeah, you know what his downfall really was? He's a bully. And he turned everybody against him. Andrew. Yeah, Andrew. Andrew. He's just, he's an abusive type of guy. He wasn't well-liked. He had some loyalty that he bought, you know, just people around him. But uh, at the end of the day, when you're a bully and you mistreat people like that, the tide is going to turn. Yeah, now, some may say, uh, Michael, Trump is a bully. Okay. And, you know, would you, would you say, because the, the argument could go from the other side. Well, Trump bullied a lot of guys as well to, on his way up. But, but you know what? The people around Trump yeah. really like him. Interesting. The Paul Manafort's, yeah. the, the Corey Lewandowski's, people that were close to him, they yeah. like him. Hey, look, you say what you want about Trump. I believe Trump really cared about America. He cared about it. And whether it was his ego or whatever it is that he wanted to be the best possible guy he can be in there for the country, I think that's what he wanted to be. Whatever motivated him, I don't know. But I feel he, he really, it really meant something for him to do well for the country, for America that he believed in. Mm -hmm. And I, that's why I supported him. Would you, have been able, would you have been able to accomplish what you accomplished in, in, in the gas cam without Mario Cuomo's help? Yes, because my, the licenses I obtained were not through Cuomo. Okay. It was somebody else. But uh, I needed those licenses, and they were tough to get, and he was able to, uh, I was able to get them. And that's what, that's what kind of separated me from a lot of the guys, because I had 18 licenses. Mm -hmm. So you, you couldn't, unless you indicted me and put me in jail, you couldn't stop my business. Mm. Can I ask a question? This is a little off topic, but I think it's very appropriate for this segment. You being a New Yorker, we just saw uh, Rudy Giuliani. We talked about the Cuomos. Pat's first day uh, uh, in your financial career was the day before 9-11. It's this weekend. Tomorrow, it's now yeah, 20 years. No, Saturday. So two days no, from no, now. So tomorrow for me, it's going to be 20 oh, years. Oh, gotcha. 20 yeah, years. Yeah. So you being a New Yorker, we're talking about Rudy. I'm just opening it up for conversation. It's a 20-year anniversary of 9-11. We just left Afghanistan. It's all over the news. I, just uh, there's no specific question but just what comes to mind when when you when, when you you know circulate through all these stories well listen because i just saw rudy i mean i i gained a lot of respect for him as mayor of new york mm -hmm. because he brought that city back mm -hmm. you, you don't right. know what new he was york, america's mayor for yes sure. and you don't know what new york was like prior to that you know I, i'll tell you a story i was uh i was out on i forget if i was you know i got busted on a parole violation and i had been out in new york for several years and they were driving me back. I had to go in front of Judge uh, Henderson Morrison here. So I was with the marshals in the car. We're driving back. And uh, I said, hey, guys, what time we got to be in court? He said, we got a couple hours. I said, do me a favor. He said, what? I said, let's drive around. I haven't seen the city in a while. I says, he says, well, what do you want? I said, I want two things. I want Dunkin' Donuts because I haven't had that in years. <laughs> You're a Starbucks yeah, guy. What's yeah. going on? No, I was Dunkin' Donuts okay. all the way. I says, and I want to drive through Manhattan. I haven't been here. And when they took me down to Times Square, I could not believe, you know, the reformation yeah, of Times be, be Square. Yeah, packing. Yeah, this is yeah, what the homie. Yeah, this was uh, right after you know Julie Giuliani got into office. He was there a couple nineties. Dude, yes. my, my father wouldn't let my my mother bring me and my sisters to the city. Oh, it was without terrible. Him. You know that you could get off the bridge on Houston Street, and I am not kidding. And people of my age know. You would have a hundred prostitutes mm -hmm. coming up to the car, right on the street, coming up to the car, rolling down your window, a hundred of them every single day. It was smut city. It was just terrible. Times Square, you, you didn't even want to go shows, to the yeah. theaters. It was all peep shows. Yeah. You know, now the main peep show now is a NYPD uh, you know, department there. But it was terrible. And the reformation of Times Square alone, what he did there, and to clean up the city. The city, you know, when, when Dinkins was the mayor, it was, it was a party for us because anything went. Yeah. Anything, what we were doing. But 
It was just a terrible place. The Bronx was burning in the late 70s. Wow, you were there, yeah. Bronx was the worst city in the country. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. what, what comes but, to your mind, Pat? What, in regards we're just, to We're talking about 9-11 New York, your 20-year financial career, everything oh, that's Oh, listen. I, I, so I had the... Uh, by the way, David, if you're listening to this, the David, you David, 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 we got to make sure that uh, Captain uh, uh, Tager goes out on 9-11. Okay, uh, just make a note of that because the captain of the spokesperson of... Uh, APA, that's okay. got to go out on 9-11. Got it. Yeah, because one of the things I asked him, I asked him a, a few different questions. So this is the guy that's always on MSNBC, CNBC, on CNN, on Fox. Pull him up, Kai. He's everywhere. Okay, uh, Captain uh, 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 Tager is his last name. Captain Tager. I think it's Dennis Tager. Yeah, Dennis Tager. Kai nailed uh, it. He's, a, he's an absolute stud of a guy, okay? Mm -hmm. And we were having a conversation yesterday. I asked him about, hey, so TSA numbers are up. It's only 10% down from what it was in 2019. So people are traveling again. Uh, you know, should we feel safe travel again? A lot of private jet businesses, charters taking off right now. Are you worried about it? He says, no, I want the wealthier to get wealthier because the more money the rich make, my business takes off. So I'm like, very interesting as mm. a union guy to say something like that. And then uh, we went and talked about uh, a few other things. And then finally, I talked to him about 9-11. Uh, I said, so a uh, question for you in regards to 9-11. Do you worry with what happened with uh, uh, Afghanistan? Uh, with the Taliban, that another 9-11 could potentially happen? And and if yes, how are we prepared for it? You know, what is the difference between today and then? I mean, obviously, we know TSA. George Bush came out with TSA in November of 01, two months after 9-11 came out. We didn't have TSA before. It was just right. kind of like you went on a flight. I don't know if you remember. It was a lot right. oh, smoother. You didn't take two hours to prepare to go on a flight. Boom, like you went. You could out. also go to someone's, like if your friend was coming yeah, in hey, town, hey, you'd yeah, go you to the terminal, right. pick them up. You At don't have to gate. go through TSA. Very nothing. different. Very yeah. now, some may say it's good. Some may say it's bad. The reality is it's longer to get on a flight. But at the same time, safer, it's safer, for, for right? Sure. So you're going through it. Much harder to do a romantic gesture, for yeah. sure. So I said, so how much harder is it today to conduct a, another 9-11? And he started talking about stats. He says, first of all, there's certain things that we have on every flight that I can't tell you about. Now, you need to know, on every flight, there's a federal agent. Mm -hmm. And he walked through it on uh, certain investments. On every single flight, there's a federal agent. He says, on every flight, there's a federal agent. Wow. Is what he's saying. Now, whether that's true or not, maybe it's not. Maybe it's... My misunderstanding, the way he said it is there's a federal agent that. on I've every flight. And then at the same time, they have a method. He says, but there's one thing that he was pissed off about that he wanted them to pass the bill. And the APA is right now doing something to pass the bill is for every one of these planes to invest $10,000 to create another layer of protection in case somebody decides to do something so they can have 10 minutes to be able to prevent the whoever is trying to take over the plane for that to not become a reality. So there's one other layer that he wants to add to it. But he says, look, I'm not going to lie to you. We are paranoid like you wouldn't believe. We still worry about if mm. the, another 9-11 could happen or not. So you asked that question for me. I think in the last three weeks, it just became more. the pers If there are odds in Vegas where you can bet on another 9-11 happening in the last three weeks, it went up. Mm. Mm -hmm. It went up. You know how all of a sudden, hey, the Lakers traded and they picked up, you know, uh, uh, yeah, Anthony Davis. Moved. The line just went 20 to 1 to 3 to 1. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you bet the week before your head. The line of today, another 9-11 happened, uh, went higher. Yesterday we're having dinner, and your wife says, I'm not traveling on 9-11. No. I just feel weird traveling on 9-11. You know, now what? She also said it could be the safest day of the year if you're traveling because right. everybody's more paranoid. But still, that thought is there. That I this feel could, the same way. Yeah. So You wouldn't travel on 9-11. I'm not. I mean, I'm here. I'm not going yeah. home on 9-11. Mm. Would you want your wife, your kids, your family traveling on 9-11? Not, not if you want peace of mind. No, I don't think that's something that it doesn't give you peace of mind traveling on 9-11, right? I think I, I would actually probably think that we are on red alert on 9-11, 20-year anniversary. Everything's on red alert. I, I don't know. I don't know, if I, I don't know if I buy that because let me explain to you. Everything about how the, ta how the Afghanistan experience was handled it was so sloppy. God. To me, it says everything else is sloppy. I had a, a call the other day with my C-suite executives, mm -hmm. and we were talking about something. I told a couple of our leaders, I said, I said, success softens people up, right? So when you win and you're like, oh, my gosh, I just made a million bucks. You get I just comfortable. Made ten, you, get you get comfortable, buddy. And when you get comfortable and arrogant, mm -hmm. you are officially right. exposed, and somebody can exploit you. If I'm an enemy and I don't like America, matter of fact, if I'm an enemy and I hate America, okay, if there's ever been an administration that is handling things in a sloppy way, that if you wanted to do some damage to America, unfortunately, 
unfortunately, this is the season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Totally. Because you're sitting there with your opponent, you're like, dude, what is the matter? Like, imagine you're dating a, a girl, uh, and, and you go to a, girl, a girl's house, and you want to meet her dad. And you see the dad. It's like, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? I'm Adam. Okay, what do you do for a living? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm in school. Do you have a job? Uh, yeah, I'm 18 years old. Uh, you going to school? I am. W what are you majoring in? I want to be an accountant. Why do you want to be an accountant? My dad's an accountant. Uh, uh, so tell me about some of your, tell me about your mom and dad. Uh, my mom's a nurse. My dad, are they still married? They've been married 22 years. Do you have any sub siblings? I have a sister. Okay, good. So he goes through a series of 45 questions. Like, what the hell is wrong with this guy, mm -hmm. right? And then he says, I want, I want you to meet my uh, son. Then a 28-year-old son shows up. How are you, Adam? I'm John. Shakes your hand. Hey, this is my sister. It's my only sister. I just want to make sure you know that. If anything happens to my sister, whatever you do to my sister, I'm going to do to you. Just so you know that. Okay, great. So you leave, right? Now you go to another girl's house. Mm -hmm. You go in. Oh, hey, Adam. Mary told me about you. You want a drink? You want me to get you something? You guys have some fun tonight. Grab the keys. You, as a boy who has one thing in mind, you're saying what? Dude. Slam dunk. I don't mm -hmm. need to worry about the dad with the second girl mm -hmm. or a brother. But the first one, shit, if I do something, the dad and the mm -hmm. brother is going to come after me. I'm not doing nothing with Jackie. But, hey, Mary, let's go out. I don't have no. to worry about you. <laughs> Jackie is Biden. That's America today. Ain't nobody afraid today. And that's a scary thought. Um, that's a scary thought. Yesterday, uh, Trump was on, uh, who's the late night guy? Gutfield. What's a Gutfield? Gutfield. Gut yeah, Gutfield. And they were talking to each other, and Gutfield asked a question. He said, look, I was never a fan of you. And he says, I never supported you, Gutfield, because he yeah. said a lot of bad things about him. He says, no, I understand. I said, but I think maybe eventually you started liking me and maybe even loving me. He says, I don't, have, I don't love you. Maybe there's apparition. <laughs> Gutfield's uh, talking uh, to who? Uh, Trump. Trump. Yeah, so oh. they're talking face-to-face. -face. And then uh, 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 Gutfield asked, do you think it's important for us to, for uh, the enemy to fear the leader? He says, I don't know about fear. I think it's about competency and respect. I don't know if the enemy is sitting there saying these guys are competent enough to handle uh, 9 11, next 9 11. How, so how could that they concerns be? me a lot in regards You've to 9 11. got a vice president who yeah. can't get asked even a, a semi hard yeah. question without breaking out into some sort of maniacal laughter, cackle like she's the Joker. Got Jen Psaki coming out yesterday saying there's going to be new mandates, and uh, she gets asked a really simple follow up Is this going to have an effect on everyday uh, American people? And she looks like the Grinch furrows her brows and goes, Only the unvaccinated. <laughs> like, this is what we're dealing with. Like, it's, it, it's like comical. Yeah. It's like the villains have taken over yeah, Gotham. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's almost like on the comic book you level. You know what, Patrick? People ask me, you know, you're a staunch Republican. I'm not a staunch Republican. I am for who I believe is going to be the be do the best job for the country, you know? I have to say this. This is the worst leadership in my lifetime by far. I mean, not even close. I mean, that's these, crazy. You lived through Carter. I mean, that's yes, a big statement. These people appear to be so incompetent. They, they can't get out of their own way. It's scary. I really, you know, I, I was thinking about that. I was going to put something together. You know, in the opening line of the Gotti movie, it's, it's brilliant where Armand DeSanti is in jail. He's talking to a guy through the uh, uh, glass. And he said, 20 years from now, they're going to miss Cosa Nostra. 20 years from now, they're going to miss John Gotti. It's like I want to flash back and say, three years from now, they're going to miss the Republican Party. Three years from now, they're going to miss Donald Trump. Not because of, tr just because of the way he ran the country. That, that's it, you know? And I, I, it drives me crazy, Republican, Democrat. You got to put the, guy in that's doing the best job for the country that's it it's not a question of per for me it's never about personality it's about policy that's it what's best for my country for my kids and my grandchildren well, yeah. that's what i look at to I, went, that, to I, that point. I went i went to a uh, uh, oyster place in boston we walk in hostess shows up gives an attitude to me and mario i said to her i said you know what i said you're not a hostess you may be a good person in the back you may be good at handling accounting. You may be good at monitoring stuff on camera to see if anybody's stealing anything. You may be somebody that can do a lot of other things. You were never meant to be a hostess. <laughs> so I said, don't take this as, uh, don't be offended by this. I had an assistant once. The guy's name was Hutang, good looking Persian kid. The worst assistant I ever had. I love the guy till today. He knows it. I talk about him. So I said, Hutang, I got good news. I got bad news for you. He says, which one do you, I said, which one do you want? He says, I want the bad news. I said, you're a terrible employee. And he says, why? I said, I said, I'm your assistant. He says, I'm telling you what you need to do for me. Mm -hmm. I said, this is pathetic. 
I said, you want the good news? He says, yeah, what's the good news? I said, the good news is you're a butterfly. You're free. Go do whatever you want to do. He says, mm -hmm. Pat, I'm so glad you said this because I want to go surf every single big wave around the world. He did that for <laughs> seven, eight years. Happiest kid alive. Met a girl, introduced me to her when I was in Santa Ana. They got married. He's the happiest camper out there. What's my point here? Joe Biden's not a good number one. He could be a good number eight, a good number five. I think I'm sure 43 years of experience is going to give a lot of insight. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. Fine. He's not a good number one. There's a very big difference between being a number five, a number eight, a number one. People learned a long time ago you could not win a championship building around Carmelo Anthony, as great as he was. You cannot win building around certain players. This was a topic with my friend Steve Avetian, and he would say, I would say, I think you can build a team around Russell Westbrook. He says, you have no clue what you're talking about. I said, what are you talking about? He says, you cannot build around Russell Westbrook to win a championship. He needs to be a two or a three for you to win a championship. Look mm -hmm. at the way this guy broke it. And by the way, this argument was seven years ago, mm -hmm. six years ago. Who's right? Yeah. He's, right. He's, right. He's right. So I don't know. I think we forget that the number one job isn't everyone's job. We have to come up with a criteria on what it is to be number one. And as much as I understand, well, you know, he's a nice guy. He's cool. He's this. He's that. When you're running a country that's a as big as it is today and you got people who hate you because you've been dominating for such a long time, you do not want to be a, uh, have a guy that's leading that, that's a softie, that isn't a bit paranoid, that doesn't have the energy, that doesn't have the audacity to sit there and ask, answer the tough questions. You need somebody that can lead that. It's there, not everyone's job. There's actually one of the most famous quotes in uh, The Sopranos about that. Tony Soprano's getting into Christopher Mosanti's, uh getting into him. And James, the late James Gandolfini was phenomenal in that role. And he basically says exactly that. He's like, you have no idea what it's like to have to make all the decisions. No way. And then when at yeah. the end of the day, after you made them, you've got to live with them and you and you alone. Is that something that you'll never have to deal with? Do you remember at the end of Last Dance when Michael started crying? Do, do you know that scene where he's like, you know what? You, know, you don't want this if, life. If you don't then, want this life. Then, you didn't then win. it is what it is. And I, I wanted it. I wanted it to win. And he says, "We need to take a break." He just got up and walked out. Yeah. And Powerful. I just felt it right now. My body just even thinking about that entire scene. Yeah. Right. Look, everybody wants to be a number one until they're a number one, and they mm -hmm. say, "Shit, I don't want to be a number one." Heavy, heavy the crown. It's not everyone's job. Why was it heavy the head that wears? The if crown, you go yeah. to Smithsonian, they show the whole evolution of what happened to uh, uh, Lincoln. I don't know if you've seen that in. In the, from the first year, he got elected to like second year, third year, fourth. If you've never oh, seen yeah, that at Smithsonian, is, is yeah, it's not destroyed. everyone's job. It, it, but he was during the Civil War. I mean, and 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 that's a real tough time to be a president, where he was mm -hmm. going trying to find his own until he found his uh, General Grant, he, McClellan. He couldn't count on. He couldn't count on any of those guys. But it's not everyone's job to be number one. Well, Michael, you said something before about you know you don't care about whether it's Democrat or Republican. You just want the right person for the job. Mm -hmm. And what you were talking about before, Adam, what I remember most about 9/11. Uh, is right after it happened. You know, I, I grew up in the shadow of the towers. The towers were beautiful. The, the Freedom Tower is gorgeous. Don't get me wrong, but there was just something about those two towers sitting at the end of the, at the end of the island there. And I grew up 15 miles outside the city. We saw them come down, and in the in the carnage, in the wreckage, my uncles were in there, firefighters, and and you know, my my both of my uncles and and my grandfather, local 40, they they worked on the towers, they built them, and then they were part of the the cleanup. Everything was gray. It's it's a devastating picture. You look at it. When, when the towers come down, there's so much ash, you actually can't tell who's black, who's white. You can't tell what race. You, oh, you're just It's people that they look like they just got through a 12-round fight. They're walking around like, my God, what just happened? And then 10 days after, to kind of put a bow on this, we started with baseball. I was at, uh, I'm sorry, it was, I think it was 13 days after, went to a funeral for my, my dad that worked in downtown and we went to a funeral and then we went to a uh, to a met game after against mm -hmm. the braves and had this massive comeback and piazza hit a home run and it was like i don't know if uh if anybody ever sees it or goes on youtube watch piazza's home run place from crazy oh the whole country you had sammy sosa running with the uh oh, sorry the uh the flag it was amazing there was no democrats there was no republicans <laughs> No, no white, no black. We were Americans. Man. We don't have that today, don't. No. They, they, we kept no. saying never forget, man. Twenty years later, we forgot, dude. And it's not only that. The Democratic Party today is not what it was 20, 30 years ago. It was a legitimate party today. You can't even call it Democrats anymore. Progressive, liberal, left, whatever. It's a different party. 
The party of John F. Kennedy and prior to that, different than what it is today. Yeah, that's not what your country could do for you. Ask what you could do for your 100%. country. Imagine right. Democrats saying to that that today. Got it. You know, Nas Wait. just gave 10 bucks and he says, Pat, you're, Pat, you're a warmonger. Just because we left Afghanistan does not mean 9-11 will happen. Quite the opposite. Also, 60 Israelis were arrested on 9-11. Stop the BS, okay? So 60 Israelis were arrested, arrested on 9-11. So the, meaning they, they also had some level of involvement. Anas, I will tell you this. And we've had Anas on before when he talked about Palestine. He's Palestinian. Oh, if you nice, remember yeah. Anas when he talked to the other uh, uh, Israeli and they were going back and forth with the whole okay, yeah. uh, challenge. So we know the optics of where Anas is at. Anas, this is what I will tell you. I have no desire to be in Afghanistan. We should have never gone in the first place. We understand there was a business element to what happened in Afghanistan. There was a lot of money being made in Afghanistan, a lot of nice contracts that was being made in Afghanistan. I don't know, I don't know the details too, but some of the conspiracies don't sound like conspiracies. They sound like things that actually could have happened, and I give it some credence. What I care about is sequencing. I said it yesterday on Facebook. I don't care about staying in Afghanistan. I care about sequencing. When a leader gets sloppy, mm -hmm. when a leader gets sloppy and is not competent to know what are his next 5, 10, 15 moves on leaving Afghanistan, you can give 10 different leaders and tell them, we want to leave Afghanistan. We're going to do a case study right now. You and your team go in that room. You and your team go in that room. You and your team go in this room. In the next two hours, I want everybody to come out with one spokesperson of each camp, talk about what is the best, most optimum way to leave Afghanistan. Ready? Go to your teams. Everybody goes in their offices. Two hours later, everybody comes back. Johnny has uh, team number one, team number two, team number three, and they say, here's what I think we need to leave Afghanistan. Then the person that's moderating that group says, I think the best plan was given by three, seven, and nine. Mm -hmm. Let's map out the 15 moves. Your move number three could be catastrophic. That's the mistake. This isn't about us staying there. The mistake is sequencing. And sequencing only happens in the wrong way when the leader is casual, no energy, afraid, and hides. That's the problem. What happened with Afghanistan is a 100% sequencing problem. And that's why now we have to hear all the stories, $83 billion of equipment that was left behind to those guys. For what? Why, why would military go first? Why would they not go last? So, so this isn't a conversation yeah. about you know, uh, all the other methods. While, the, while they're demanding $3.5 trillion in yeah. new uh, and now human infrastructure, the, they just leave $90 billion behind. The administration is asking about, well, hey, the Taliban, you don't have enough women in your administration. What the hell are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? What does that matter? Well, do you point? even think they, like, do you think they care? Do you know how they view women in the country where I came from? Like, mm -hmm. how do you think these guys view women? If you only knew if the, if, if the left only knew how they treated women and the LGBTQ community, you would fully be on a different side if you knew how they treated gays, lesbians, and women in the country uh, with all this mess that's taking mm, place. I but mean, Patrick, you know confused. what that is? All that is is a deflection. You know, they're, they're pandering to their base, trying to get women on their side, deflecting what's really going on there. That's what they do all the time. Everything is a deflection. You know, it, it, it's mind-boggling that the, some of the things that you just said, the chaos that was there, I, I can't understand it. I, I don't In know Afghanistan how, now? Yes. It, well, it, can I say one thing? There's no rhyme Because obviously we've this. been kind of going down a path here. Let, let me just put some facts out there, and th this might be controversial, whatever. We're leaving Afghanistan, okay? I think even the left, or I, I don't even like using left or right, I think even mainstream media is calling out Biden for how sloppy this is. Finally. Certainly, it could have, it could have gotten better. Mm -hmm. Different perspective. Obviously, we all want to bring Americans home, have our allies be safe. Short term, it's a shit show. Long term, though, who do we really need to be focusing on? Not so much the Middle East anymore. We need to be focusing our attention on China. They just double the troop so, size in Syria, dude. Okay. They well, hear me out here, Gerard. Well, hear you, they took the so, troops out of Afghanistan. They moved them to Syria. But, okay. It's not like they came home. But the the big picture is we need to be focusing on China. And, you know, our problem in our government is we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. I know we've got 800 bases all over the world. The real problem these days is not the Middle East, it's the Far East. So if it takes getting ugly and messy in Afghanistan in the short term for our long term to wake up and say, China's the real threat these days. China's the real enemy. Long term, there might be some major benefits there. So that's just a different perspective. I, Nobody's I, happy of what's yeah. happening in Afghanistan right now. Mm -hmm. But then again, for the last 20 years, nobody gave two shits about Afghanistan. We all wanted to get out of there. 
So, like I said on a couple podcasts ago, it's very easy to get into a war. It's very ugly and hard to get out of a war. Especially when it's profitable. You don't want to get out when $24 trillion are spent in 20 years and 21 mm -hmm. of that $24 trillion go to private defense contractors. Mm -hmm. And now I mean, it's going to be someone else's mess to clean up. Yes, again, an ugly exit. But now Pakistan, China... India, Russia, this is a regional situation. We have the luxury of having two beautiful oceans, one that's very cold on the left side, one that's very <laughs> warm on the, on, the, on the right side to, you know, secure our borders. Whereas in the Middle East and in the Far <clears throat> East, it's all intertwined. And it's, this is China's problem now or India's problem or Pakistan's problem. Thankfully, hopefully, long term, not an American problem. Yeah, the problem is, though, you know, I, I think it was a lot less of a problem before this chaotic exit that we had. Yeah. And now it could be another breeding ground for terrorism. And you got to understand this. And, and Patrick, you should bear me out. Mm -hmm. They don't hate anybody as much as they hate America. That's Agreed. it. So I think, you and know, yes. And whether we're there or not there, they're still going to hate us. Yeah. I understand, so, but they have more power now. They have, they have more leverage. But, okay, we can still be... We can still take down terrorists like we've been doing for decades and decades and decades yeah. without having to build a nation. We well, were never going to rebuild a democracy in Afghanistan. It was never going to happen. Let me, let me ask this. So whether we said we're leaving on this day or this day or, or just kind of like leave in the middle of the night, the Taliban's not going anywhere. You guys have both ran large companies. You guys have both been in charge of hierarchical structures, right? When you look at your competitors and you see them mishandling situations like this, does something go off inside of you? Is it like blood in the water for sharks, and you say, okay, we need to exploit this while it's happening now? Is this something that catches your attention when, you're, <clears throat> when your uh, competitors are, are fumbling the ball this bad? Or, or is this something where you say, you know, what's the, what's the greater play here? Like maybe, maybe there's a greater strategy at play. Oh, for me, absolutely, especially on the street. When you see weakness in, in your competitor, you strike. Got That's it. it. 100%. Sun Tzu says when an enemy is about to make a big mistake to fall, get out of their way. Okay? So, which means uh, just you don't even need to get in the way. They're going to, they're going to. Yeah. Now, in sports, Belichick never, never will stop say, an enemy from defeating never, himself. Never uh, let a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, what, a, what is an interception called? It's called a turnover. turnover. Never turnover. let a turnover go to waste. Like, right. you see how a guy, you got possession, do something about it capitalize you screwed up yeah. right so you know the whole atlanta falcons against brady the year they were supposed to win it's mm -hmm. like what the hell are you guys doing you yeah. just keep giving 15 plays that could have gone the other brady way you would have won that too he's like yeah. and they were passing what up the by hell are you, like, doing? What are you like, doing what is yeah so I, I i don't think there's a right answer i think it's all on situational of where you're at in a situation like this i agree with you by the way Nas, i heard your second comment it says pat now that you said it this way i agree with you but going back to what you said uh, adam i agree with you uh, because here's where we're at here uh, with the entire situation. So the number one enemy in the world for U.S. is who? Number one enemy. China. Okay, China. China. The Democratic Party. Some, pe some people, was, well, first of all, no, you know, Alexander said I have well, met so the there's enemy. No, there's no difference no, no. between the Democratic Party Alexander, and China. So should, Alexander said I have met the enemy. It is comment. I. Alexander said I have met the enemy. It is I. So America's biggest enemy is themselves. But let's set that aside. After us being our own worst enemy, then it's who? China. Taliban came out and said, our biggest ally is who? China. China. Something yeah. very strange happened this week by mm -hmm. two personalities that, you know, when you think about Ray Dalio or George Soros, you think George Sor Soros is what? He's the biggest funder of Antifa. He's the biggest funder of... Mm -hmm. You don't think about George Soros who would say, let's be careful with China. But here's what happened this week. Very interesting. One story is a Business Insider story about Ray Dalio, whom I interviewed, one of my favorite interviews that I did. Hedge fund billionaire Ray Dalio says investors shouldn't ignore investing opportunities in China even after the recent market turmoil. Business Insider. Billionaire investor Ray Dalio told Bloomberg that opportunities in China and Singapore can't be neglected. It's a part of the world that one can't neglect, and not only because of the opportunities it provides, but you lose the excitement if you're not there. Dalio said when asked about his family office plan in the region, and so our objective is to be there both economically and investment-wise. This is Ray Dalio. Then George Soros comes out, and it's a CNN story. He calls out Ray Dalio. George Soros calls out BlackRock's China blunder. The billionaire financier philanthropist thinks BlackRock has made a huge miscalculation on China. BlackRock recently started offering investment products to individual Chinese investors as the country's first uh, entirely foreignly owned fund management firm. But Soros slammed the move, claiming the company appears to misunderstand President Xi's 
China. Soros highlighted Xi's recent crackdown on private business, which he sees as proof that the regime regards all Chinese companies as instruments of the one-party state. He also referenced an enormous crisis brewing in China's real estate market and Xi's effort to redistribute wealth. These trends, he said, do not augur well for foreign investors. Soros also thinks that BlackRock's initiative is a threat to democracies because the money invested in China will help prop up President Xi's regime, (laughs) which is repressive at home and aggressive abroad. Very confusing for Soros to make a comment like that about China. Who would know better than him? Who would know better than him? Mm -hmm. Who would know better than him? But but for him to say, stay away from China, that's, uh, you know... You mentioned something earlier, really, really adroit about the inner circle having special. Yeah, This, to me, reeks, and this is pure speculation, but this, to me, reeks of a guy who was promised a seat on the inner circle, did everything he was told to do, funded everybody he was told to fund, and didn't get a seat on the inner circle, that he was used, that he was never going to be a part of it. You think this is a direct thing between him and Dalio or him and the current I administration? I think, I think it's somebody that tried to get in to bed with Xi. And then found out who Xi really is, and this is this is the truth of the matter, and this is something the whole world has to understand. That's who, actually not bad, by who the way. Who Xi Jinping is? By the way, that's actually not bad. Xi Jinping <laughs> is going. He is going to take over the world, or he is going to die trying. People do not pay attention to to what's coming out of China. They do not pay attention when this man speaks. Xi Jinping is is a. Uh, uh, an ambitious man on a level we haven't seen in a hundred years. Your guy, General Spalding, talks about this, and there's also been other people that you've you've interviewed with on the hundred year marathon. Xi Jinping has accelerated that progress, and he is completely unabashed in his own speeches about his plans for for the future. And they they do not include a world of democratic response to government. He thinks government should be in control of everything. He thinks there should be one world government and it should be his government under his control. Uh, He believes in global competence. I think that's great news, though. Let me tell you why I think that's great news. Here's why it's great news. Say you and I hate each other. Mm -hmm. We sincerely hate each other. We're enemies, whatever. You're a real estate company. I'm a real estate company. We can't stand each other. You defend uh, one guy. I defend this guy. That guy's a really bad guy, but you keep defending him, okay? So you go in bed with him and try to do business with him. He royally screws you over, mm-hmm. royally screws which, which you over, this kind of seems which like. this kind of seems like it. Then you sit there and say, "Freaking Pat, he's not as bad as I thought he was. Let me call Pat. Then you, so he indirectly got us closer, which is a good thing. So the fact that Xi is doing that in China and it's now getting Democrats and Republicans to both agree on the fact mm-hmm. that you cannot take China lightly, that is a very, trust very, their word. that's a very good news for America. We can we can uh, pose a lot of different things. It's fine, but there's one thing you do not want the left and the right to not dis- not agree on, and that's China. Is that my enemy's yeah. enemy is now my ally? Was that what that? Yeah. Is? So G essentially true. G essentially made Soros defend America, which Soros, Never you, you know his reputation after, after twenty Never years does. of destabilizing America. I mean, are yeah. you kidding me, Soros? is maybe one of the most hated guys in America on many different lists because the guy's got power, money, and he's a manipulator. and Literally and actively a, destabilizing yeah. the country. No, no, and he, he's involved in a <clears throat> lot of different things that he did. So so when I saw this message, I'm like, what the hell is going on for Soros yeah. to say something? Well, I like, is, this, is this the guy who broke the Bank of Britain? It, it, not everything's black and white. There's a lot of gray and, and all this. Like, even in the Middle East, yeah. like, even like to use your Syria example, yeah. You have the Shiites and the Sunnis yeah. and, the, and then ISIS and they're fighting Al Qaeda, but Al Qaeda is not friends with the Taliban and yeah. the Taliban is Sunni. And then actually the in uh, the uh, we're friends with these people up yeah, here, and then sure. in Kashmir they are fighting with them, and it's just like you know what, what it reminds you me can't of? even you solve remember, it. Remember in uh, the last Batman movie, the Christopher Nolan with Bane, Tom Hardy playing Bane. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the businessman thinks that he's got Bane under control. And he's like, you get over here. And Bane's like, <clears> I'm already here. And he says, I've, you know, and he finally puts his hand on the guy's shoulder. Leave. Oh, no, don't leave. I'm in control here. Do you feel in charge? And then the guy realizes in this moment, oh, man, I made a deal with the devil. Like, yeah. and, then, you know, and he turns to the guy and he says, I paid you a small fortune. And Bane looks at him and says, and this gives you power over me? <laughs> Snap. Mm-hmm. And that's Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is looking at all these capitalist dummies mm-hmm. saying, you know, I've given you but, but I love that. I've given you 20 love years that. of power. I love that. Here's why I love that. I love that a person like that reveals his 
ambitions publicly because now it unites two different parties. Mm-hmm. I love it. If it can get on the TV. But, 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 it, but listen, Soros has influence with the left. Yes. Mm-hmm. They I listen to yes. Soros. So when he says it, you have to know. Like imagine the people are like, okay, who said it? O'Reilly said it. It must be right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Who said it? Anderson Cooper. It must be right. Okay. Who said it? Don Lamont. He must be right. Don Rachel Maddow must be right. Hey, Tucker Carlson must be right. There is that community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, okay, George Soros said it. China sucks. That's fine. I, I actually think this is great. Now, hmm. there's a part of it which, you know, you heard what Rudy Giuliani says. Well, I, I supported him for the governorship because I needed money for funding. That's politics, right? there. You just mm-hmm. heard it, right? Mm-hmm. Where he said that. So we don't know that part of what happened, who got offended, who got upset. Because at that level, when you're a billionaire, man, you're, most of your life you've been winning a lot of the fights. You've been winning a lot if you're a billionaire, right? It's not like you've been losing. You've been winning a lot. You've been losing too, but you've been winning a lot. So you're not accustomed to not being right. Mm-hmm. So Soros maybe is not happy with somebody we don't know about. Yeah, exactly. Soros is 91 years old, by the way. But, but he is. Just to put it in perspective. It's not like he's got big plans for himself. Like you said, he wants to sit, be in the inner circle with China. Well, his kids too. His kids. Okay. Are, We're his just saying himself. He's 91. Yeah. Now I don't I don't know if you 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 what's your point with that? Though? No no just pointing out that's how old he is old as shit. Yeah, no, but ninety one years old. If do you think a guy that gets to his age, like Kirk Kerkorian was doing deals at ninety nine years old before he died. I mean John Wooden died at ninety nine years old at Ronald Reagan Hospital in L A. So do you think a guy like that that you think the fire's missing? You think a fire's no, not there? Not that's at all. a true but believer. It, it, is the fire missing? Probably not. Are the skills still where they're at? He's Pull up a picture of George Soros. That matters. Uh, the my, my only father that a, matters is thinking. My father at 101 was talking about opening up businesses. So when it, that's in your head, okay, it doesn't matter. And he made it to 104, 103. Wow, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, but, but, by the way, what's the story? What happened with Fauci and and uh, Rand Paul? Kai, can oh, you pull man. up that story for us to read it? There's uh, a, you were talking about it at dinner last night. It, it came out. I believe it was the Intercept. That Fauci apparently had uh, he lied again. Completely lied in which part? Under which, oath in Congress. Lied again. Yeah, the last time that that he came out. Uh, it's it's moments like this where I do wish the mob was kind of still involved in our government. To be honest with you, me too. Uh, Rand is, Paul <laughs> says the new Wuhan documents show Fauci lied. Can you go up a little bit to see if I? Okay, yeah. Some rounds of the public documents revealing the extent of U.S. funding coronavirus research in Wuhan shows the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease head Anthony Fauci lied during his previous testimony to Congress. Fauci has adamantly denied that the National Institute of Health funded gain of function research in Wuhan. Paul blasted Fauci in a Tuesday tweet saying that the NAID director had lied again and I was right about his agency funding novel coronavirus research at uh, Wuhan, said Rand Paul. Go up a little bit because the tweet's down here. Uh, Rand Paul tweet. Surprise, surprise, Fauci lied again, and I was right about his agency funding novel coronavirus research at Wuhan. Read this thread and the paper's release. Can you click on that just to see what that is? He, it, is he it made a, a formal request to the Justice Department to open an investigation. Let's sure. read this. Let's read this. So newly released documents provide detail of U.S. funded research on coronavirus at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The Intercept has obtained more than 900 pages of document detailing work of EcoHealth Alliance at the Chinese lab. The trove of documents uh, includes two previously unpublished grant proposals that were funded by the NIAID, as well as the project updates relating to EcoHealth Alliance research, which is scrutinized, aimed, increased interest in the materials show and contracts and returns and forms of grants. The materials revealed that the resulting novel laboratory generates SARS-related coronavirus also could infect mice engineered to display human receptors on cells. Interesting. So what's going to happen now? Because yesterday somebody asked Jen Psaki, she just walked off. That's the thing. Yeah. You you asked this question to Rudy. It was yeah. one of the best questions you would ask. Yeah. You said, if you know these guys are, are corrupt and you have the evidence, all it takes is for one of them to crack. You just need one of them to crack and the rest of them will fall. Why 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 is it how how come you know you, you talked about Omerta? How how is it that these guys nobody talks over there? And what he says is, is that nobody's threatening them. So the mafia never talked until we took all their stuff away, the, uh, the racketeering act. You take somebody and you put them in a large conspiracy and say, hey, you may not have done uh, all this, but you're attached to the guys who did all this, and are you going to go away for them? But Gerard, aren't you seeing what's happening here? Trump gets impeached for a phone call that he made, okay, that wasn't anywhere near as disastrous as the phone call that Biden made to the president of Afghanistan and asked him to lie, straight out lie to the world. Mm-hmm. And what happens? Cricket's out of Pelosi. Nobody wants to say anything. This is such a corrupt system right now. 
It's such a double standard that we have. It's disgusting. I can't even believe it. If you and I were to do something like that, we'd be doing 100 years. Mm -hmm. It's terrible what's you, happening in this country. Do you think politicians on both sides lie? Absolutely. Okay. So, so let's, let's put that side aside, meaning, you know, uh, the left's going to lie, the right's going to lie. Okay. And the left is always going to show the one tweet or oh, this guy was lying, and the right's going to say this guy was lying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fine. So let's say uh, oh, oh, there is uh, 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 sinners on both sides, and you know mm -hmm. the saying, people sin in different ways. Okay. This is where I'm going with this. Put that aside. If a person's leading an army, if a person's leading a country, if a person's leading a family, okay, if a person's like, hey, where were you? You know, I was with my friends, okay, and we were watching a game. Hey, what were you doing? What is the core need a country demands from their leader? Forget about the lying part. I don't think we've had a president that hasn't lied yet, okay? Left, right, so middle, safety. doesn't matter, right? Safety. So, so number one is safety, right? Okay, great. Would you agree with that? Safety Keep is number one? Keep the country one? safe. Keep number the country one. safe. Yeah. Okay, so I don't care what you're saying, what you're spewing out, because sometimes, you know, we have pride, and we're like, well, you know, no, 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 and we're like, eh, maybe over-exaggerated. You know, I don't think anybody's going to be uh, uh, innocent of that, right? Okay. Are we getting safety? What's next after, out of safety? I would say justice. Okay, so justice, fine. What is after justice? So justice is a form of safety to me, by the way, because sure. justice provides me to know that a bigger guy is not going to bully me because I know law and order is going to uh, uh, protect That's me. That's right? something I got to be honest with you. I've lost faith in over the last 10 years. I do not believe that we are all operating under the same set of rules. I, I, I think yeah. somebody, your political affiliation yeah. is going to determine whether you're innocent or guilty, not the actual committing of the crime. How can you hold one party accountable, to one person accountable to something and let the other one go with the same crime? You know, Patrick, this country is going crazy. I am a former criminal. Do you know that in San Francisco now, they are paying criminals not to shoot other people? What? I don't paying their money. Bucks. 300 bucks. <laughs> yeah, but that's not new, what's what? going on in San Francisco. No, like no, that's this not, is like, no. This, 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 is this particular just, story. But it, it's the but San Francisco it is, well, this has been is, crumbling for I understand, a decade. I understand, but you know, uh, I don't you know think about this decade. doesn't spread? How long? That's where no, Nancy Pelosi decade, and Kamala Harris are yeah. from, and Diane Feinstein. Yeah. Three of the most powerful people in our government are from San Francisco. That's their home. Yeah, well, by one of the greatest cities in the world. I know we're talking about your girl. You went there. She's like, I'm not going to get it. What I'm saying, I use the Biden Trump thing because how could you hold somebody? so accountable for something that they did and somebody did something even more grievous and you just crickets you let it go yeah what's going on in this country is the, the justice, double standard is horrible the justice I, department I, can't be politicized man it just can't be it is it is 100 percent. and uh, again bring this up I, and i don't care who it is hunter biden's laptop gerard if you and i had information just the stuff that we've heard yeah. forget about what else might be on there we would be doing a hundred years. You would be in jail with no bail. You'd be doing a hundred years. Anthony Weiner's too, and everybody forgets about that one. Well, I mean, uh, uh, but this is the president's son who is using his father's po political power to ingratiate himself into. And I mean, you can, and it's right out in the open. Has it been going on? Of course, but this is right out in the open. You have to act on stuff like this, mm -hmm. and they're letting it go. Otherwise, people lose who's faith? letting it go? You though, in your in your opinion, what what do you think they should do? And I'm not a Hunter Biden fan. I just it's not like it's not in the news. It's not like exactly. they can't go after them. Exactly. Who should do something about it? Obviously, Justice Department. Joe Biden's not going to do anything about the it. Justice but, Department. Okay. Well, but he's by controlled who, by the we, Democrats. We talk, we, talk right about, now. we talk about January 6th and how serious that was and that there was a January, January 6th commission. Um, and there were hundreds of riots where people actually died. Billions of dollars of damage. No, you know, you they know take what? over Portland. They take over the city of Portland, American Patrick, city. You know what the Nothing's done. You know what the biggest insult and slap in the face? I don't know if you've watched uh, you know, the recent thing on 9-11, the documentary. With uh, Condoleezza Rice and all those guys. And yeah. all of that. What do you think about it? I thought it was great. Okay. Uh, what's his name? The uh, the black film producer uh, did it. What's his Tyler name? Perry? No, not Spike Tyler. Spike Lee. Perry. Spike Lee. Spike Lee. Oh, Spike Lee. Did it's it. brilliant. Yeah, you got to watch it. It's it'll is make it you. Lops, is it one sided or no? No, it'll make you cry. He did a brilliant job. Okay. On it. I have to say, Spike, Spike did a brilliant yeah, he's a good job. Good filmmaker. But no, no here's the thing. Yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking I, if Spike there's Lee, motives. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. No, I, I did, we, like yeah, I get it. I want to see what Michael. We all remember the devastation of that day. We all remember. No question. It was nothing like it ever in our lifetime. For these people, AOC and some of these people, to compare what happened on January 6th oh. 
to what happened on 9-11 is, is the most disgusting thing I have ever heard. Yeah. 3,000 lives lost. A, a city, bur- the worst thing that ever happened compared, you know, other than uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. And that was at least all military. Mm-hmm. And for them to say that January 6th was worse than 9 11. Who's saying this? AOC oh, dude, said I, it. I Pelosi, made a whole video about it. Got Pelosi a million views and it, it got taken down. They're treating it worse AOC than what happened. Yes. And, and Pelosi. These people well, just say disgusting. these things and not, not held yeah. accountable to it. It's an insult to everybody Whether, that whatever died. Whatever side you're on city. the aisle, that's just doesn't a dumb matter statement. what. Yeah, it doesn't. I it's would not agree dumb. With it's not dumb. It's worse than dumb. You don't. You don't insult it's dark, people like it's this. dark and divisive, mm-hmm. and it's offensive. I would put all of that. And she lives in New York. Yeah, but you have to realize again. Respect the 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 enemy has to get respect for her knowing how to move naive people who are looking to find a person that they hate because of whatever reasons, right? Like one of the guys I'm interviewing right now that we put on the list yesterday, you know, he, again, another guy that's a communist who hates capitalism because capitalists make a lot of money and it's not fair. I'm, I'm like, I can't wait to talk to guys like this. These are the kind of types of guys I want to talk to. They're convincing. They get people to say this makes sense. Like AOC is very, very convincing. Yes. Mm-hmm. She's got, you know, you, you have to know, I'm telling you right now, there's a 10 to 20% chance AOC is going to be president of the United States one day. 10 oh to God. 20? Uh, you're saying lower or higher? Oh, my God. I, I, lower or higher? Please be lower. Has oh, to be lower. Okay. I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet right now. If she stays alive, she stays healthy, I'm willing to bet. She's right. going to be a president. She's got another 40 yeah. years. Of- oh, let, let, let me tell you, she's doing something that Roger Stone said the most important thing for somebody to be a real candidate is what? Relevancy. Eyeballs. Is relevancy, relevancy and eyeballs. Yeah, he's got, by the way, you like Logan Paul? That's a qualified guy that could be a president in the next 20 years. You can hate Logan Paul all you want. That guy is going to be a candidate to run for and presidency one day. we're supposed to compete with Xi Jinping. Well, like, it's like yeah. m- m- who's the girl that you even brought up her name? The, the girl, the governor of... Uh, Christy No. Okay, yeah. never heard of her. We talk politics all day long. I've never heard of her name. She's amazing. She says, never heard her name. Zero relevancy. So we've all heard of... Yeah. You know, I'd be, I, I'm, I'm getting easier and easier to, to to be sold on Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin's doing doing. I've been calling for Joe stuff. Manchin for gonna four run, years. Though. I don't know if no. he's going to run. I don't think that's in his. Uh, uh, he should though. I don't think he's going to run. I don't think that's something that. By, by the way, let's talk about a, a story that has to do with what just happened this week uh, uh, regarding uh, your former boss. You know, story came out with the fact that uh, you know, uh, legendary Colombo boss uh, Carmine Junior Persico was a top echelon FBI informant. Court records say. Wow. You know, story came out. Y- you dealt with them directly. You spent time with them. It, it, how much credence you give to this article? This story. That article was insulting. It was fabrication. I don't believe it in any way, shape, or form. Daily News should be ashamed of themselves for putting that on a front page with a picture of a rat. Listen, I knew, I knew Junior very well. He was no informant. He was no rat. You know, I hate that. You know, Patrick, I hate the term rat because, you know, all the Internet warriors now, they throw that around like they know what they're talking about, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, it, it's a disgrace to even say that about the guy. And listen... I mean, he was my boss. He also put a contract on my life when I walked away, you know. So he, he wasn't happy with that with that move. But uh, absolute, absolute nonsense. I'll read it to you. It says, official boss of the Colombo uh, family on uh, whose side Greg Scarpa, the Colombo Capo FBI informant, and Roy Lindley, uh, Davicio Scarpa's FBI handler, were working. Carmine Persico was himself since decades early in the government's employ as a member of its top echelon informant program, wrote attorney David Schoen, who submitted a document in July in a Brooklyn federal court filing aiming at getting his client, one-time acting car, uh, Colombo boss Victor Ori, uh, Orina, 87, which we spent a lot of time talking about him, 87, out of prison on compassionate release. Persico died in 2019 at 85. Uh, he served 32 years of his 136-year probation uh, prison sentence following his conviction in the Mafia Commission case. So you're saying there's zero credence to him being a rat. No, what they're saying there is Greg Scarpa, who we know was an informant for 20-some-odd years, might have been trying to, maybe he got some information out of Persico. Persico didn't know that uh, he was an informant, you know, Scarpa. So maybe some things coming from Persico were going through Scarpa to the government, not with Persico's knowledge. He didn't know that. By the way, uh, Kai, do you have the Chin Chiganti comment from, uh, uh, from, uh, 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 what do you call it, Rudy? Rudy? If you're not from what Sammy and uh, Michael said, because uh, Rudy said something different about the chin. I don't know if you have it. Is this the one or it's a different one? 
This is the one? Okay, so we talk about chin, and, you know, chin's a, a power, all that stuff. Rudy had a different thought. I'm curious to know what you have to say about what Rudy said. If you want to play it, Kai. We were going to do a big raid, and we were going to arrest the number one or number two people in each family. They did that about two weeks before. Well, Chin Giganti, who thought he was number two in the Japanese family, but he wasn't, because everybody hated him. They told him he was number two. He was like number eight. <laughs> Chin is the guy who walked around in the robes and acted like he was crazy. Well, he was crazy. He was a borderline personality disorder in the military. He was actually, I think, officially, officially uh, diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. He was, yeah. So, but, he, but he played he played it up. So, this information comes out. One of the agents comes in and tells you, you know, I can't believe this. Chin checked himself in a hospital. He thinks we're going to arrest him. He can be very disappointed when we don't arrest him. Did you end up arresting him? Yeah. Eventually, but not for okay, that. Got it. We're not for that. So it, 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 it displayed to the whole world. They've been, they've been lying to him. For several years, tell you, Shin, you're number two, you're number two. Number yeah, I want to, yeah, forget Shin's crazy, don't listen to Shin. <laughs> wow. Fat Tony knew he was nuts, so he made him think he was number two. But he never, he said, how come I don't go to the, how come I, how come I don't go to the, to the, to, to, to the commission meetings, I'm number two. They say, you, you know, Shin, you're too high profile. Uh, with that bathrobe and all that stuff. If they see you walking in, they'll know where we're having the meetings. I have, to, I have to disagree with that. Really? Oh. Yes. Why is that? Kai, can you pull up a picture of this guy? You Chin Giganti. Chin was number one. Chin was number one. Absolutely. He was the real power behind the Genovese family. Did you ever have yeah. a dealing with him? Or? I did. Yeah. How, how was he as an individual? You know, <laughs> we walked down Houston Street together, and uh, he was in his bathrobe, hair mussed up. He didn't shave. Go back, Kai. Slippers. Bathrobe. Uh, but he was as lucid and as intelligent as anybody could be. You know, my father was thrown out in military, being uh, military, Bad being road. paranoid, schizophrenic with homicidal tendencies. Now, was my dad <laughs> maybe the homicidal tendencies, but <laughs> but he wasn't schizophrenic. Uh, so, listen, you know, people ask me all the time, was Chin really, you know, goofy? And listen, to play goofy for thirty years, you got to have a little bit of craziness in you. But he was he was sharp as a fox. Oh, you think that was a ruse? He was putting on a ruse. Hundred percent. Really. Hundred percent. Hundred huh. percent ruse. How, they, how they have hours and hours and hours of taps, and they, so he they explain how how that guy could get that that wrong. He, he, I don't know where he got that information from. I don't know. And look, even Fat Tony. I mean, Fat Tony was the boss, but he consulted with Chin all the time. Hmm. Michael, let me ask you. You said uh, your boss put a contract out on your life. Yes. So this is a two part question. What does that mean actually in reality? And what was the most most you feared for your life in your entire years uh, of being in the mob? Well, because I walked away from the life, I basically betrayed my oath, and Persico put a hit out on me. I mean, the feds told me that. They said my father went along with it. You know, I mean, I had all of that when I was in prison. That's why they locked me down. They put me in administrative detention. But um, l let me tell you the deal. You know, one of the... One of the horrors of that life, Adam, you make a mistake, your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out again. Your best friend. Your best friend or somebody close to you, obviously unsuspecting, right? Mm -hmm. You walk into a room, you don't walk out. Well, I had that experience one night. And if you want, you know, I can take a minute to describe Please. it. I, it was all gas business stuff. A story came out, I believe it was in Newsday, I'm not positive, that said that I was getting powerful enough to break away from the Columbos and stop my own family. Total nonsense. It was ridiculous. It was fiction. It, it, not, it was no semblance of reality to it. But, uh, you know, I started... Real quick, how does something like that become news? Is there, like, a competitor know. that decides we're going to screw with Michael or let's, let's you know, Who leak knows? some... You know, sometimes reporters just create... I mean, I, I can tell you so many stories that there was just no truth to them. Hmm. They just create these things, you know? I was pretty high profile. I was getting a lot of attention. And um, so guys, you know, on the street, you know, hey, you know, anyway, he's turning in this amount of money. Maybe there's more, you know, and it said I was making two billion dollars. That was not true. And so, you know, Persico started, uh, you know, questioning some of my Russian partners and, you know, word was going around on the street. So 
My dad uh, was out on parole, and he calls me up, and he said, look, we got to go to a, a meeting. I go to his house. We're in the driveway speaking. And he says, uh, Junior wants to see us tonight. I said, okay. I said, what time do you want me to pick you up? Because my dad was on parole. He only traveled with me because I tried to keep him safe. And he said, uh, Mike, they want this uh, a little bit differently. They want me to come in first. They want you to come in second. Long story short, I was a poet. I said, Dad, you know to talk on the street. Why are they going to let them separate us? Let's go together. We were both captains at that point in time. We argued about it in the driveway. I think I might have told you this, Patrick. And I said, uh, you know what, Dad? I don't agree with you, but I've been listening to you all my life. If that's what you want, fine. So um, I drive in. It was late at night. We had to meet Junior in a house in Brooklyn because it was a covert meeting. He was on parole. Didn't want to get violated. So Jimmy Angelina who was another captain of family, uh, I meet him in Brooklyn. He says, get in my car. We're going to drive to where the meeting is. I get in the car. There's somebody sitting in the back seat. Mm, never I recognize him, but I didn't know really who he was. Jimmy don't even introduce me. I get in the car, and um, he's very closed mouth. He's not really talking. You know, he starts talking about the Yankees. You know, I'm a diehard Yankee. I didn't want to hear about the Yankees that night. <laughs> we get to the house in Brooklyn. It was late at night. And it was about a 30-yard walk from the car to the basement apartment that we had to go into. And I get out of the car. I'm assuming Jimmy's behind me and maybe the other guy behind him. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm getting scared. I said, this is, this is a bad setup. What's going on here? Now I'm thinking everything's going through my head. I'll be honest with you. But when, when I recount this, I can, I can smell the fragrance. It was oh, an geez. August night. Wow. And I can hear the crickets chirping like that's PTSD. how real this was yes and i'm uh, i'm walking down those steps and uh i'm scared i mean my knees are starting to buckle i, I mean it because when that door opens i said the last thing i'm going to see you gotta understand i mean i I've, I've been around since right. you were keenly like aware of it at that moment very aware of it. why didn't you run you didn't you know people have asked me michael why didn't you cut and run and it, it wasn't heroic it was robotic you just become so much a product of that life. You say, well, if this yeah. is it, this is it, you know? And that's what I honestly thought. You know, I walk in the door. Obviously, I'm here because if it would have went the other way, I would have right. walked in the door. It would have been over. But so we have this whole big thing in there questioning me about the gas business and so on and so forth. And I started getting mad. I started getting angry because you got to understand, I'm turning in a lot of money, a lot of money. And, uh, and this was my deal. I mean, I put it together. And uh, but then I said, wait a minute, I'm, I'm here with the boss. Let me calm down. You know, I'm, it looks like I'm going to walk out of here and we get in the car. And, you know, I was really angry with Jimmy. I turned to him and I was uh, really That's your about, friend, Jimmy. Was a good, my good friend. And he says, stop, wait, don't say anything. I said, what? He said, you know, you held yourself pretty good in there tonight, Michael. This could have been a real problem. And so now I got even more mad. I said, you knew this? You're my friend. I know you my whole life. You don't tell me anything. So he looked at me. He was a smart guy. And he said, if it was the other way around, would you have told me? And I thought about it. And I said, no. Damn. He said, you know, he said, this is the life we live, Michael. He said, you know it as well as anybody. You grew up in it. And, uh, and then I walked out of the car. I don't know if I ever told you this. As I'm, I, I didn't know what to say. I was kind of speechless for a minute. I mm -hmm. go to get out of the car. And he grabs my arm. And he says to me, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to want to hear this, but it's the truth, Michael. I said, what? He said, your father was in there before you tonight. He didn't help you one bit. Oh, my he God. He hurt you. Okay, with that in mind. Well, here's what happened. Yes. I'm walking back to the car, and I'm saying, what, what could my— then Now that's all I was focused on. What could my dad could have done? But knowing him so well, I know what he did. Hey, my son does everything. I'm on parole. If he's stealing money, I have no idea. He just threw me under the bus. He didn't back me up. Why? At all. I don't know why. I'll be honest. I don't know why. I never said a word to him about this. I just kept it in. Never you said never brought it up to him? No, no, I never said a word. But when I was writing my first book, I put it in the book. I had to. It was too much of an impact on my life. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you this. If that incident did not happen... I don't think I would have ever walked away from the life. It was my dad's betrayal in that regard. Now, he denied it. That's not true. He denied it. But I knew it was true. But if I said to myself, this, if this life can separate father and son, what do we really have here? But the point being is after that experience, nothing really scared me. Wow. So what I did when I left the life, I said, okay, they're not going to walk me into a room. 
I'm moving to California. I said, they're not going to have to send a hit squad to come and get me, and I'm prepared. I'm not going to walk my dog at the same time every morning. I'm not going to go to the same restaurant. I'm going to stay out of clubs. I'm going to be very disciplined. They're going to have to work hard to get me. So I never was in fear after that time. I just was careful. You and, talk uh, about respect and loyalty a lot, right? But is there any trust or even friendship in this life? You know, there is. I had, I had friends and I had, you know, I, I trusted in people. But you got you to gotta understand something. When a boss gives you an order, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's it. I mean, look, I had an experience. I had a very dear friend of mine that got killed. And I believe he got killed for the wrong reasons. And I could not save him. And they warned me. They said, if you warn him, you're in trouble. And, you know, I mean, I, I still live with that today. That's a horrible, horrible thing. Um, but that's the thing. The oath comes before anything. And if you're given an order, you got to do it or you suffer for it. Well, my God, you know, and I really apologize if this comes off as disrespectful, so forgive me. But, I mean, how could you ever look at your father the same way? I mean, how could you ever – I mean, you're a father. You you just had your fourth child. Is there anything in the world – where you wouldn't t- take me instead, like my God, like why would you? What would but ever but cause that, you but to? But that's that's why Sonny, the guy did fifty five years. He didn't need to do fifty five years. Sonny could have easily worked with anybody, and you, you're not dealing with a regular guy. You're mm-hmm. dealing with a true believer mafia, like mobster. Like that's my opinion. I think you may say part of it that's a true believer, but. It almost you know, sounds like a religious extremist. You know, the the like, articles you know, like, written about Sonny are very different than anybody else. Patrick, let me tell yeah. you this about my dad. And this is the truth. And, I, and listen, I love my dad. I love him like forget it. You know. So, but, but I'm telling the truth about him. My dad's legacy in that life meant more to him than anything. That's what I'm saying, yeah. He just wanted to be known as the stand-up yeah. guy. Now, you know, all the good things he said to you about those guys, yeah. when he talked to me, this life is full of shit, Michael. I mean, he would tell me just like yeah, that. Really? You got to want, oh, yeah, life is like a wheel. It's going to turn. The guy that loves you today is going to hate you tomorrow. We would go through, and he educated me, which was great. Good feedback, by the yeah, way, some of that. Great. Yeah. Uh, great no, whatever he told me was spot on. There's no doubt about it. But I had, a, I had a conversation with my dad once, you know, and I said, Dad, you know, you don't understand. You destroyed the whole family. He got very insulted. I said, my mom, 33 years without a husband, she's a basket case. My sister dies of an overdose of drugs, 27 years old. My brother, drug addict, 25 years, turns into an informant. I said, you got to claim some responsibility for this. She said, no way. I was framed. If I wasn't framed, none of this would have happened. I said, but dad, you weren't framed because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the life we live. They're yeah. coming after us. Yeah. And you sacrificed your entire family. He got very upset he with me. He probably got upset because he very knew, upset you, were, you were close to the bullseye. He got very upset with me. He would never accept responsibility. And, and that's what kind of, you know, I was always, when it, my mom and dad had a very a chaotic relationship. They always back and forth. They loved each other, but it was always a lot of hostility in the house. And I would always side with my dad, always side with my dad. And then towards the end of my mom's life, I started to listen to her a little bit. And I started to see things a little differently. So when I would pr- approach my dad with that, he would get upset with me. Mm. <laughs> Michael, for those of us that have no clue about this. We're on time. I have one other topic I want to sure. go with. So if you want to wrap this up, I got one other question I got for you. But please, if you want to wrap up. No, so, you know, look, I mean, I love my dad till the end, but we had a difference. I mean, that that really Im- impacted me, obviously, you know, that, that whole situation. So it was just different between us. More power to you for being, you've been married now for how many years? 37. 37 years, five kids, you have seven total, yes. right? Your family is happy, they love you, you see them wanting to be around you, that's the biggest a uh, way to judge a father or a parent if the kids still love the dad after 20 30 years their pops and moms they did some right if they want to be around them so that uh, props goes to you but i'm telling you when I, you know from my experience when i was spending those three days with your dad those three times that we were with him very different i've not met many people like him he was a fully like true believer like a general like a jack nicholson from a few good men that's like mm. what are you talking about this yeah. is 
like to that point of conviction. Duty, yeah. very dutiful. Very dutiful to him. Now, listen, that doesn't mean other people believe that. That doesn't mean, you know, you live that life. That just means that's how mm-hmm. his. Mm-hmm. Uh, question for you about two characters. I'm curious to know if you have anything to say about this. One is Johnny Russo. One is John A. Light. Both of them have been on Valuetainment. Both of them have gotten millions of views. John A. Light, you know, he's, you know, especially right now with the interview taking place, Mafia States of America, there's a lot of people making videos they're happy. Some mm-hmm. are not happy. Some are calling you out. Some are calling Michael out. There's a lot. Some are calling Sammy out. What? 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 What can you say from your experience? You guys were both in the. Was it Rip City, New York? Uh, I don't know what that documentary well, was. Here's City. Here's City. Here's City. Both of you guys were Rip City. Is, I'm thinking about uh, the basketball. Yeah, Trailblazer. <laughs> so what? What? What is your point of view of John Aylett? Everywhere I go when I run into Albanians, they adore, they admire him. What can you say about John? Patrick, I never met the guy. I never heard of the guy. I never knew anything about him until he came up on social media. For some reason, he decided to make comments about me. Um, Again, I don't know anybody that knew him. I don't know anything about him. And I've always said to myself, I'm not going to make my name by knocking other people. I'm going to leave it at that. I have really nothing to say about him. How about Johnny? How about Johnny Russo? (laughs) Johnny Russo. I mean, he's almost a comedy act. I mean, this guy has done everything in, in, in the history of the United States and beyond. I never met him either. I don't know anything about him. He says a lot of things that happened, you know, during the making of The Godfather. I was around. I never seen him. I'm not saying he didn't show up. But I think a lot of the things that he's saying are just, uh, he's an actor. Uh, what more can I say? I mean, some of the stories is just. It's, it's, by the way, another great storyteller of what he's. Yeah, know, what, I, I'm unfamiliar. What are, like what are you know, some of the stories? He said oh, something you just about have to go watch it. Like Saddam Hussein, he sat in the same chair as yeah. Saddam Hussein. Stuff he did with the Shah. Uh, stuff. And by the way, the way he tells a story, it's so detailed that's like, it's, you know, it's extremely detailed on how he tells. I told him when I sat down with him, I said, Johnny, first of all. I enjoy being around you because you're so entertaining. I said, but if 10% of the stories you're <laughs> yes. telling me is true, you lived a ridiculous life. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's, the, he's the mafia Forrest Gump? Is that the- he, yeah. sa- he said one story about Joe Colombo blowing up the gates of Paramount Studios, and that would be huge news. I never heard that happen ever, you know, and I was around during the whole Colombo Godfather thing, you know, when it was being, I never heard any of that stuff. He spoke very highly of your props, very highly of your props, like, you yeah. know, who he was and, you know, what he had to say. I doubt my father ever met him. Okay, you know. got it. So, uh, so let's just do this because because Mafia States of America is going to come out here soon. We don't know the dates. We're going to reveal it, and who knows? Maybe even we end up doing a live event together with me, you, Sammy, Chaz. Who knows? Maybe Rudy at the Fountain uh, Blue in South Florida and invite and you know tickets. I don't. know. That would be an interesting live event if we did something like sure. that. So maybe after all the episodes are live and people have seen it, then maybe we may do something live. It's not not everyone's going to be able to attend because that place only fits about 800. But I can only imagine what types of people would come then and the kind of security <laughs> we're going to need for us to conduct that yes. thing. But uh, the first thing that we are, I want to show you this. So this is a coffee mug that says Mafia States of America. And here's how it works. When you're having the coffee and you put your coffee in there or your tea, this is what happens to the mug, which is pretty cool. I don't know if it's happening yet or not. Oh, yeah. I see an see image. It? Yes. Yeah. Gradually, the image comes out. That is cool. That is pretty cool on Mafia States of America. And the longer it sits, the more evident it becomes with the mug where you see literally oh. the thumbnail of uh, our sit down. So this water is not that hot. I'm putting my oh, finger yeah. in it. It's not burning. But So it's Sammy and I on the same? Yeah. So <laughs> it's the mug comes out with you and Sammy. It's, it's literally, yeah, a, uh, uh, literally that's a mug oh, shot, by the way. Yeah, there it wow. is. That yeah. is pretty sick you if got you see the, uh, this. I'm going to hold it here so folks can see it. So before I did this, I don't That's know if you want to hold the camera. When, when, you, when you get into the gas business, did you ever think you'd have your own merch? No. <laughs> <laughs> Never. You're going to bring it close. So first, it looked like this. Wow. Just cool a black that? coffee mug. Then you put the hot water, the hot tea, or the coffee in it. Next thing you know, Sammy mm-hmm. shows up, Michael shows up with uh, Mafia States of America. It's really, really cool. We only that got, is cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Who so, came up with this idea? Well, the guy who did it, you know, we've done some work with them, but we uh, uh, set this up. Kai and Mario dealt with them, put it together, so it's pretty exciting. For folks who'd like to get this coffee mug, Sick. we're going to put the link below. Uh, Kai, put the link below both in the description and in the chat box for people to find it. I think at this point, we're going to sell it later on, but at this point, the first hundred are going to be able to all order one. 
the first 100 that place the order, you're going to get that muck shipped out to you. We don't have a big supply today. We will once we launch the whole thing. But right now, the first 100, if you click on the link to order it, you'll get your first uh, limited edition moff, uh, Mafia of the State. Sammy and I get one free? Yeah, we're going to give that to you. That, you don't have to pay for anything. <laughs> but you. we're excited about this thing coming out, Michael, uh, uh, as usual. Uh, you always have an interesting take on uh, uh, any topic we go on. I think you're one that you can talk sports, you can talk politics, you can talk business, you can talk mob, you can talk history. There's not many topics that we can talk to. I think the only thing we can talk to Michael about is uh, snowboarding, skiing, cold oh, weather. Snowboard. That's the only thing no you have weather. no desire to discuss. None, none whatsoever. Gang, if you listen to this, if you enjoyed today's interview, smash that subscribe button and the thumbs up button. We're going to put Michael's information below as well if you want to go send him a message and follow him on Instagram as well as his YouTube channel. If you've not followed his YouTube channel, it's a must watch. It's a must subscribe to his channel. All that information will be below. Michael, once again, thanks for coming on and being on Thank the podcast. You. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. This great was time. great. Thank you.